Was it decided to close the contemporary school at Woodruff? I don't know. And I'll tell you what they're told, because we, we didn't even do it. Okay. That's really bothers me, because we should have had something. We didn't. They, um, there are a number of, we've got a teacher shortage. Okay. And so what they're trying to do is get some, they, by closing that down, they can pull some teachers out of the Woodruff Contemporary School because they've got small class sizes and put them out into the regular buildings. That's the idea behind it. The problem is they did it on four-day notice. We've got kids that are in there that don't fit anywhere else and we're, and we're successful. And see, that's a problem with me because I had a brother who um, didn't do so well in a large classroom setting. So he went to Woodruff to, you know, he can conduct himself in a better manner. Um, I went to Woodruff at a certain point in time for behavior problems, but I mean, I still went to Woodruff, and I mean, it's just, I don't know, I'm, I'm against it all, <laughs> so. You know what? You're Who made the decision? Gonna, well, we're going to ask, because he was the superintendent a couple of minutes ago, he made it, because no board members did, we weren't even asked. And see, that's the thing, I mean, as a board of education for District 150, I believe that the board should have been involved in that. Because it wasn't documented in any of the meetings. I looked back at the last videos. Yep. Nothing was brought up. Mm -hmm. It wasn't. No, I got, I so, <laughs> I guess. That's why these, oh most of these people are here from Woodruff. Oh, and I can't wait until um, you're one, the biggest fan of the district, to get up there. The one that's always at every board, board meeting talking about Woodruff. I would like to call the Peoria Public Schools District 150 on. Okay. meeting to order for September 12, 2016. Would you please call the roll? Dr. Davidson Avilas? Here. Mrs. Jackson? Here. Mr. Shaw? Here. Mr. Sierra? Here. Mr. Walter? Here. Mr. Adler? Here. Mrs. Ross? Here. Eight present, we have a quorum. Thank you. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. a motion to approve the minutes from August 6th and August 22nd, 2016. President Ross, I move that we approve the minutes from August 8th, 2016 and August 22nd, 2016. <laughs> second. Thank you. Second, move in second. Uh, would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Kostick. Dr. Davison Avilas? Aye. Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Shaw? Aye. Mr. Walter? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Seven ayes, motion carried. Okay, uh, community recognition. Uh, the Community Contribution Award this week recognizes the outstanding teamwork of AMP Radio Group, Walmart Stores on University Avenue and Allen Road, and Northwoods Mall. Mall. Together, these organizations, uh, their customers, employees, and listeners of ESPN 96.5 FM and 98.5 KISS FM, 99.9 .9 WWCT and 101.1 .1 
JACKFM generated donations of school supplies double the amount collected in the past year. It's a project we hope um, to work together to grow in years to come. Tonight, we're happy to uh, welcome Jen Berwitz. Did I say that correctly, Jen? See here? of AMP Radio, Bob Swaltz of uh, Northwoods Mall, uh, Cherokee Sydney of Walmart on University, and Ryan Ballard of Walmart on Allen Road. If you're in the audience, okay. Good evening. How are you? I think it is now. There you go. Uh -huh. Wanted to say good evening, and we do. Uh, you have the names of the managers, but we have some of the assistants here tonight. We have Daphne and Derek here with us, and we are very uh, proud and pleased, and wanted to say thank you for our step a bus uh, activity that we do at the district level. Uh, this. Uh, activity. This project allows us to be able to provide supplies for our students at the schools and so because of your efforts we are able to make sure that all students coming back to school um, get the necessary school supplies. So tonight we just wanted to say thank you for this partnership. We couldn't do it without you. We appreciate the effort. Thank you. Uh, would, any, would any of you like to make a comment? Yes, come While on. you're up here, would you like to make a comment? Hi, I'm from Northwoods <laughs> Mall, and I just wanted to tell you that um, the future of our kids is right here in this room. Uh, Northwoods Mall will be there, and we will help you any way we can now and in the future. Um, all you have to do is ask. You know, we'll be there for you. Thank uh, you. We've started a great relationship, and we're planning on continuing that now and in the future. So thank you for allowing us to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you all. Are there any, is there an, any board member would like to make a comment on this issue of this recognition? Thank you. Announcements. Do we have announcements? I have an announcement. All right, great. <laughs> Here I go. I'll go first. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> Yet? Yeah, now? Yes? All right. <clears throat> board member. Oh, I'm sorry, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Citizens concerned about education may wish to tune in to this week's primetime PBS programming called Spotlight Education, shown locally on WTVP. Spotlight Education is part of American Graduate, Let's Make It Happen, a long-term public media initiative to help all students graduate from high school ready for college and careers. This week's programming includes All the Difference, 9 p.m. Monday, the stories of two young African-American men from Chicago's South Side who achieved their dream of graduating college. Next, there's Frontline, a subprime education, 8 p.m. Tuesday, an examination of the for-profit college industry. Also, the impact that a program to stem the high school dropout crisis had on one young woman. TED Talks, Education Revolution, 9 p.m. Tuesday. Innovative approaches to education are discussed, as well as the school to prison pipeline and how to help struggling students become scholars. And finally, NOVA, School of the Future, 8 p.m. Wednesday. How the Science of Learning May Change Education for All Children. I don't think you're on, are you? There you go. There I am. 
Tomorrow evening, staff will be at the Peoria City Council meeting where the mayor is expected to issue a proclamation recognizing the importance of school attendance. The mayor and city councilwoman, Beth Jensen, graciously invited staff for the proclamation to join in our attendance campaign efforts this school year. As you know, we are promoting that every student attend every <coughs> class every day because attendance does count. We hope you can join us or we'll tune in tomorrow's council meeting. And I know it's really important. I had my sign in my yard encouraging attendance and I woke up one morning and looked out the door and it was gone. So hopefully whoever took it, it's in your yard. <laughs> Other announcements? I have an announcement. <clears throat> All right. Well, Alignment Peoria is a collective impact organization created to align diverse community resources in support of the Peoria Public Schools in order to raise student achievement, improve the health and happiness of children, and advance the economic and social well-being of the community. After forming a potential governing and operating boards in spring 2015 and seating the official governing board this summer, Alignment Peoria has begun a search for an executive director. Applications are being taken for the position until Monday, September 19th, or until the position is filled. The executive director position presents an opportunity to contribute to the future viability of the Peoria region by leading the drive to improve education through collaboration. Information is at www.peoriapublicschools.org. Just scroll over employment to find the link to this job opening. Thank you. If I could interrupt for one minute, I have an announcement. There's a vehicle in the parking lot that uh, is R649462. Your alarm is going off, and I'm, I'm afraid that the alarm will cause your battery to go down. So if you like, take care of that. Thank you. Other announcements? I have one. <clears throat> a uh, public meeting will be held on Tuesday, September 20th, to gather community input on the future of the Peoria Stadium. The meeting from 6 to 8 p.m. will begin in the stadium concession area and include tours uh, of the property, weather permitting, uh, we'll be walking, otherwise we'll be in vans. Uh, representatives of the Peoria Public Schools and the Park District will present information on stadium's current uses and cost of upkeep. Uh, so the agenda for the meeting will start with the property tours from 6 to 6.30. Uh, we'll spend a half an hour after that uh, going over the objectives, uses, and uh, cost of uh, facility maintenance of the facility and then spend the last hour brainstorming and discussing uh, acceptable uses for the stadium property. Um, public is invited to complete a short survey on Peoria Stadium property prior to the meeting uh, to help guide our discussion on the 20th. And a link to that survey is at www.peoriapublicschools.org. Um, so if you click on the event uh, located on the website calendar, you can get to that survey. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shaw. Okay, this Thursday is Parent University, co-hosted by Valeska Hinton and Keller Primary, and both principals are here to tell us more. So, Mrs. Powers and Mr. Turner. Mr. Turner. Good evening. I'm Katie Powers. I'm the principal at Valeska Hinton. <laughs> shorter and um, we would like for everyone to make their plans now to attend the September 15th Parent University featuring our wonderful family attractions at Glen Oak Park, the Botanical Gardens, the Peoria Zoo and the Peoria Playhouse. It's this Thursday and we'd like for everyone to RSVP for the Parent University hopefully by noon Wednesday, September 14th at www.peoriapublicschools.org backslash RSVP. This way we can make sure that we have food and space for everyone. This year at the Parent University, we are highlighting exciting family attractions throughout Peoria. Participants that will come will receive the Parent University passport each month. Families who attend any two Parent Universities uh, evenings this semester, one semester, will be entered into a drawing for great prizes. The prizes include a Bradley Basketball Family Fun Day, which includes game tickets and a meal out, an iPad Mini, Riverplex Recreation Center Family Membership Movie, 
packages, and much more. Hi, I get to explain the transportation for this event. There will be no parking in Glen Oak Park for this event. I'll say that again, no parking in Glen Oak Park. So, there will be shuttle buses running from four schools at 4.30 Thursday evening from Keller and Valeska Hinton and also from Manuel and Peoria High and those shuttle buses will take people to the Woodruff High School parking lot. And then at Woodruff there will be parking for the other families who choose to drive to the event. So all parking will be at Woodruff. And at Woodruff families will get a color-coded ticket which will tell everyone which locations uh, they'll visit when and then Buses will take families over to Glen Oak Park to each of those sites. At those sites there will be dinner provided by Sodexo and there will be presentations and then families will rotate through each of the three sites. Shuttle buses will take families back to the Woodruff parking lot starting at 6.30 on the half hour or families that rode the buses from the four schools, shuttle buses will take them back to those sites at 8 o'clock. And did I mention there's no parking in Glen Oak Park? <laughs> okay. Um, and again, please RSVP at the website. There, is, uh, there are a couple special events that you want to take advantage of. Um, Dr. Karat's doing a presentation on the sales tax, I think at the zoo, I was told. And there will be voter registration that evening. And should be a great event. Did I mention there's no parking at Glen Oak <laughs> Zoo or Glen Oak Park? Um, so we encourage everybody to come. Those are fantastic um, facilities that we have in this community, and I hope everybody comes out to, to see them and take advantage of this opportunity. Questions about parking? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> OK. Uh, we're now at the place on the agenda that provides an opportunity for members of the community who wish to speak, who wish to address the board. As you know, we are all volunteers elected by you to oversee the development, implementation, and maintenance of a quality education for the students of Peoria District 150 schools. The board welcomes your comments and suggestions relating to this goal, recognizing that we all have our First Amendment rights of free speech, we ask that your comments be focused on those issues within the board's authority. There are some issues we are not at liberty to discuss in public as such as personnel and other executive session topics. However, if you have a specific personal concern that needs to be addressed, we will get a staff person to help you. In addition, board members are accessible outside of these meetings. Our phone numbers and email, emails are listed on the website PSD150. Org. Um, we realize that five minutes may not be enough time for some of you to express your thoughts, so we have uh, installed a comment box, and we didn't bring it with us, but if you have one, give it to the secretary <laughs> uh, in, uh, to compile and share with the board and superintendent. Um, no more than five minutes uh, for minutes on each topic under discussion except with the concurrence of the majority of the board. When you are, uh, you are recognized, please come to the podium and state your name for our records. Each speaker has five minutes and no one under age 18 may address the board unless accompanied by a parent, guardian, or a teacher without the consent of the majority of the board. President, President Ross, I have a question for you. Uh, I would like to waive the 20 minute cap on well, discussion with the concurrence well After I just wonder 20 minutes we will okay bring I would bring that in to you okay I have a timer on 20 minutes okay thank you uh, <coughs> Kathleen Durf Durfenbaugh did I say your name correctly Ms. Durfenbaugh Durfenbaugh okay sorry ladies and gentlemen of the board Superintendent Pull your Karan. mic down a little bit. Sorry. Yeah, there Sorry. you go. Thank you. Um, I'm Kathleen Duffenbaugh. I live at 4525 West Rockwell Drive in Peoria. I have two grandchildren, 
that are um, students in District 150. I graduated from Peoria High School. My daughter graduated from Richwoods. I have, I am a stakeholder. I own a home. I pay taxes, and I am very much concerned about our schools. The reason that I'm here tonight, I was much a fixture at the board meetings for about two years, and after the <clears throat> past administration left, I thought I would give the new administration a chance to make some changes. The changes that hap happened this past week, I find unimaginably crazy, first of all. Why in the world would you close a school and it's not a program, it always has been called the contemporary school since it was started. Without notification to the students that it's going to affect. Our school system is not for us, it's not for you, it is for our children. It is for their well-being to grow into adults that can be productive members of our society. The children that go to the contemporary school at Woodruff are our most vulnerable children in this school district. These children have issues similar to my grandchildren. I have a grandchild who's autistic. I have a grandchild who has ADHD. These children are not cookie cutters. Our kids are all different and they all have different things that they face each and every day, whether it be socioeconomic situations or emotional situations or things that are beyond their control, such as autism, a, excuse me, ADHD. All of these things play into how they learn. The contemporary school was started to help the emotional well-being of these children succeed and be able to get an education in a smaller classroom with, with less interruption. The classrooms in our school district are large. It's very hard for these students to be able to focus and pay attention to things that are going on. Also, the behavioral problems we have in our school is very apparent and everyone knows about them. Anyone who has any dealings with our schools knows that there's fights on daily basis. We have students out of control. Teachers don't want to come to District 150 and work here. Why? Because we don't support them. We're not supporting our staff. We need to support our staff. The behavior that happened this past week, I am appalled at. First of all, I do not understand how the board could have let a school start two weeks and then close it. How can that be fiscally responsible? I would like an answer to that. I've heard that it was fiscally irresponsible to keep this school open. Those students that go to that school will tell you differently and they are sitting behind me tonight. And each and every one of them cried real tears, ladies and gentlemen, when they were told that they, today you're here and Monday you're here. And some of these students have never been in a contemporary classroom, or excuse me, a, a traditional classroom ever. Do you know what the psychological and emotional upset and upheaval that can do to them, let alone the upheaval that they're going through already at home and in their lives with whatever issues it is they're facing? We have to look at education differently. It is not just throw the whole pot together and this is how we're going to treat everyone. We do need to focus on the fact that all of our kids are important, each and every one of them, including these children. I don't care if it was 67 or 390. Those 67 lives matter. Every life matters. And I expect an answer from this board. I don't know if I will get it. I don't know if I'll get it from the administration. I've asked before. And all I'm telling you is that this was wrong. It was handled wrong. You should stand up and say that it's wrong, and you should correct it. These kids deserve an education, and they deserve one where they will succeed. And they were succeeding. Pastor Harvey Burnett.
Harvey Burnett. Past Pastor Harvey Burnett. Honor and deference to our superintendent, uh, Dr. Karat, our board president, uh, uh, Mrs. Ross, and all of the uh, board members and all of those that are here tonight. Um, I'm not here to discuss Woodruff, although that is a very worthwhile discussion to have. I was at the board meeting when they first closed Woodruff years ago, uh, and as, as fate would have it, I'm here tonight. But I'm here tonight to talk about uh, coaching in District 150. Uh, athletes first, winning second, is the National Federation of High School Coaching Philosophy adopted by the IHSA and taught through its ASEP certification process. Sadly to say that this philosophy is not embraced by all coaches and schools in District 150. One could ask and say, how do I know that? Well, during my time with the district, I was the head track coach of both boys and girls at Lincoln Middle School, assistant boys track coach at Manuel High School, head girls basketball coach right here at Roosevelt grade school, and volunteer assistant coaches of both track and basketball at both Manuel High School and Roosevelt prior to that for a number of years. I was uh, the first and only head coach of the District 150 grade school summer girls basketball camp and grade school uh, co-ed track and field camp. Uh, because I was not a teacher, I was required to take the ASEP certification courses, which included a sports first aid and uh, more recently a concussion requirement. However, in order to be gra a grade school coach, there was and is no course or training requirements. The current uh, practice of District uh, 150 is that uh, if you are a teacher or an assistant, then you can step into uh, a, a coaching position both at a high school or a grade school level with little more than concussion training, CPR training, and sports first aid training. Uh, and at the, high school, uh, at the high school level itself. Aside from uh, standard district-wide uh, employee CBT training, um, uh, there is no specific coaching training either in high school or grade school level for sexual harassment or sexual abuse, or are there any um, uh, defined coaching standards of con uh, conduct, team building, and program progress monitoring. In this district, we have coaches losing whole teams, causing athletes to quit or walk off the team, uh, kicking athletes off the team for little or no reason, during the course of the season without ever having to explain or meet with either athletes or the parents to discuss the woefully inadequate results. Yet those same co coaches maintain a stipend and uh, payments from taxpayers without their actions ever being called into question or accountability. We have coaches who have never had to produce a coaching plan or explain team philosophy to an administrator or overseer if they were overseen. Uh, how is their work justified? By principals who know very little or nothing uh, about uh, the sports or the needs uh, and their interaction between uh, coaches and parents? I know of situations where coaches have received multiple complaints from athletes and parents about their demeanor, having an inappropriate actions, uh, but who continue to disrespect the public that is part of our name, Peoria Public Schools. I recently received a half-page uh, guideline from a coach, and I thought that that was at least a positive step, that stated that the coach was unavailable to be contacted by any parent at any time on game day. In other words, don't contact me for anything until I'm ready to be contacted. What of an athlete injury or an emergency? That same sheet spoke that the athletes would be held accountable. Standards such as these are not only hypocritical, but wholly inadequate for a public school. This is not a private or exclusive institution uh, where talent uh, has been hand-selected. A public school is an institution where every employee should be accountable to the public uh, that it serves, even coaches. One particular coach who I personally reported for sexually uh, grooming a child, although removed from the girl's coaching position, yet continues to coach uh, District 150 children. In part because the principal was afraid of the union reprisal, and in this case, no sports-specific sexual harassment or sexually uh, inappropriate identification training had been delivered to anyone. Neither the principal nor the coach knew of the nuances of sports-specific sexual grooming in high
how to identify and avoid it. As a certified USATF coach, part of my annual training is to complete a safe sport training program whereby we review standards of accountability uh, towards athletes, parents, and families. We're taught to identify hazing, sexually inappropriate interactions with athletes, and implement safeguards and standards. Mr. So Burnett. Yes, All right. Thank you very much. Thank I you. appreciate it. I think you got the message. Thank you. Ainan <laughs> Tababa. Tababa. Hello, my name is Ian Teverball. I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. Up until the beginning of this school year, I always had a very hard time dealing with the pressure and stress of trying to learn and get my own work done. I have a hard time paying attention in a larger classroom. What Woodruff has done for me is to shrink down the classroom setting and give me the one-on-one -on -one time that I need to fully grasp the education. I have spent my entire life looking for where I actually fit in to the educational world. I want to keep I want to keep the school open not only for me but for every other student that truly needs the same small class education that I do. Many other large classroom setting many other students that benefit from the school will not be now be thrown back into the same large classroom setting that doesn't work. So I beg you, please don't take away the home that I call Woodruff. I feel that I finally found where I belong. Board members, if you really have big hearts for children, you would keep the school open for the pe children who need this education. Thank you. Uh, Board members, thank I'm you. Ian's Lord, father. My name's Lord, Kurt Teverbaugh. Lori, that's who I have. Well, then I will that? address you personally, Ms. Ross. It's going to be in regards to the article in the paper on Saturday. And your quotes, by the way, backing Dr. Karat and her decision that it was in the best interest of the students. So we'll, we'll have that conversation in private. Okay, okay, that's fine. Um, but I, if you want to speak, are you speaking in place of Lori? No, she's coming oh, okay. up to speak. okay. I didn't have your name down unless you have a but I'm up down here. on the card. Okay. We will have that conversation. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Lori Tebaba. Good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak and address the board tonight. Um, as you... That was my son that was just up here speaking. And so he has a lot of determination to keep the school alive. Um, my son has been tried through different segments of the school system. We've put him in private schools. We've put him back in District 150. We've taken him to other private schools. And I'm, as his mother, just trying to find the means to give him the opportunity to succeed. We finally were given the recommendation by District 150 to, why don't you try Woodbrook? They're a good school, and at first when I heard that, I thought, what? I'd never heard of it. I had, had no idea what they were talking about. And so my ex-husband and I, his father, we went and visited the school and found out that, you know what? Let's give it a shot. Let's give it a shot and see what happens. My son has been a completely different human being since he started this school. He's a happy child. He's learning. He's thriving. And he wants to go to school. This is something that hasn't happened over several years of different trials. I didn't even know that this school existed. And so, you know, you guys talk about the decreased enrollment. Well, maybe we should advertise. Maybe we should let parents know. I had no idea. And so, I mean, to me, this is a travesty that we're going to take this opportunity and yank the carpet right out from under their feet. They, my son had to go back to the school that he just came from that recommended him going to the contemporary school. 
and he's just like, Mom, I feel completely lost. I'm back in the same situation I was just in. And, you know, had they given us some notice, I found out from a bus driver on Wednesday, I got a phone call, said, your student will be taking bus number 112 to Lindbergh, High, you know, Lindbergh Middle School on Monday. And I said, oh, really? That's news to me. When I got home from work that day, I finally received the letter. I got a call from my son, and he was crying on the phone because he said, Mom, we need to get a lawyer, and we need political action. This is ridiculous. And I said, whoa, whoa. And at that point, the only thing I had known is what the bus driver told me. And I thought, I, I have to clarify some things. I don't even know what happened. And so when I got home, we read through this. We talked about it. And I started making some phone calls. I have some people that know some other people in political powers to be. And so I made a lot of phone calls. I was on the phone a lot. And the, the reason I kept getting was there's a gap in the teachers. There's not enough teachers to fulfill all the spots that District 150 has. I get that. But my student counts too. He's my son. And I want him to succeed just like I have. I'm a, I've been in this community for many years, almost 20 years. I pay taxes. I've done everything, like I said, within my ability to send my kid where I thought he would succeed. And this is the first place that this is actually happening. So I want to know what it is we can do to reverse this and what the solutions are now that my son's thrown back in a public school without the amenities that he needs to succeed. You know, I, one day I took him to school last year. It was a frustration. We were very stressed at home. We tried to help him. He tried to tell us, what can you do to help me, Mom? We were just at our wit's end, you know? And so this was the, the light at the end of the tunnel to say, hey, this is, I think this is it. He came home as happy as can be, and this completely destroyed him in one fail swoop. And so if there's anything that we can do to, you know, rectify this, please, you know, whatever it is, if I can help, if I can get the community to rally, if I can get, you know, the support, if it's funding, if it's fundraisers, if it's whatever we need to do. Because I can't see my son making it through another year, let alone with us at home, because we're all going to be stressed out the whole entire year. I'm more stressed than he is when he goes to school because there is not the opportunity that he needs. And, I mean, these kids are really in the minority. Most of these kids... And I, I'm not going to claim to know every single student that goes to that school. I don't. We're new to this class. But they all have disabilities. And so what you guys have put out there is that these kids with disabilities don't matter, is what we're hearing. These kids don't matter. Well, I'm here to tell you I'm their mother. I'm the mother of my son. I'm, I feel like I'm the mother to all the kids that are going to this school because we want to make a change. Thank you. And I'm sorry. Thank, so, you. thank you. Uh, Kevin Hoskins. Hello, my was that good? <laughs> Hello, my name is Kevin and I'm here to talk about the closing of Woodruff Contemporary School. Um, what it's just wrong that it was just I literally had like 30 minutes notice that, well not 30 minutes notice, but 30 minutes we got called. And then we got told, three days, three days, it's done. It's all done. I have to go back to my normal school. I have to go back to Rolling Acres. I'm not saying Rolling Acres is a terrible place, but I couldn't function there. I couldn't do what I had to do. I couldn't function normally and I couldn't do the, anything that I had to do regularly at Rolling Acres. I have panic attacks and I have um, anxiety disorder. I have Tourette syndrome as well, which causes um, involuntary movements and vocalizations that I cannot control. I think that this, I, I was fitting in great at Woodruff. Woodruff was awesome and it just helped me a lot while it, while it lasted. I think this is very inappropriate to close this school and that's really all I have to say. Kevin. Um, has been 
bullied, made fun of, threatened, um, unbelievable things that kids do now. And this is the only school where they treated him like a student, like he was worth something. And to take it away from him and put him back in a regular school system, he's going to fail. In fact, the majority of children, I was reading up on it, the majority of children that get taken out of these kind of schools will fail in a regular school system. And I don't want to see that. He wants to be a doctor. So I'm doing everything that I can. I'm a 75-year-old grandmother, and I'm raising him and his sister. So I don't know what else to do. Thank you. Derek Scott. Testing. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak for students that normally wouldn't have a voice. Um, I'm a teacher at WCTC, and I'm being transferred somewhere in the district starting this week. I don't know where. I want to first thank the District 150 for hiring me six years ago, and I will continue to serve whatever role you guys need me for. Um, my intention in speaking isn't to have you change your mind on closing the school. However, I hope that I might shed some light on a need the district may have in the future, and I hope to address uh, how we're going to reintegrate our students back into the regular school setting. I'm from Peoria area, and I'm fortunate enough to begin raising a family here. My wife and I started our careers on the south side of Chicago teaching, and I followed her down here to this town, my hometown, without a job seven years ago. I thought for sure God had a plan for me when I heard that the district was starting an alternative school a year after I moved down. You see, my brother was an alternative student. Regular school gave up on him a long time ago, back in the 90s. And if it weren't for my two caring parents, my mother is here with me today, he wouldn't have been able to finish high school, go on to serve our country in the Marines for four years, and now work a successful job for the state of Illinois. Every day when I walk through the doors of Woodruff, I'm reminded of my brother and thankful that our students have a place that they can call home because I know how difficult the regular school setting is. After receiving a call from a parent last week asking me to speak about the good things that happen at Woodruff, I thought I'd give you a glimpse of what a typical classroom looks like. With the parents' approval, I want to talk about six students, some of whom are here today. So I want you to close your eyes and imagine for a second a teacher standing in front of a classroom of six students. Sitting in the front row is a Caucasian transgender male who identifies as a female. This student also suffers from social anxiety disorder. The student in the desk behind that student is an African-American female student who suffers from a behavioral disorder and is working 30 to 40 hours a week to help pay for household bills. She also tends to cuss out teachers on test day due to her anxiety. She calms down, however, when she finds out that her language doesn't get her kicked out of class. Right beside that student is a 19-year-old African-American female student who should be a senior but only has junior credits. She's a social butterfly, but unfortunately for her, remains this way after the bell had already rang. Keep your eyes closed for a second. That's only half the class. Sitting behind the social butterfly is a very quiet Hispanic girl who would, you think would be a mute if not for the constant prodding of a teacher with a manageable class size. You see, this student doesn't value school as of yet, and without the constant redirection and praise, wouldn't show up to class. She may not even be noticed in a classroom any bigger than 15, as she remains back in the shadow of anyone else willing to speak. At this point, you may think the teacher has their hands full, but we still have two students. Sitting to the right of the quiet girl with a desk between them sits a very motiv motivated African-American girl that just had a baby. She appreciates all the times you give her one-on-one -on -one instruction as you walk by her desk several times during the period to make sure that she's staying awake. Last but not least is a female African-American student who has been with us at the contemporary school since, since its inception six years ago, starting off on the junior high floor and then transferring over to high school. She's already seen her ex-boyfriend drop out because of attendance at a bigger school in the district, and now her best friend is not going to school because he was not asked to come back to us at Woodruff and chose not to attend the first week at Manual like he was supposed to. The class you may notice isn't super excited when I go through my syllabus for U.S. history and lay out my four quarter plans where I'm about to teach them colonization in America and reconstruction after the Civil War. Astonishingly enough, the class, after a week of classroom procedures, modeling, redirection, a mini talk on how to handle warnings, a talk about how to avoid write-ups, and finally the big talk about respecting the class, is engaged in lessons 
And you know what? They're even talking to each other sometimes. In fact, the grades in that class range from two A's to a D. Our attendance policy still matters for some of the students. I worry about every single one of these students and the 60 other contemporary students as they get rushed back to their home schools and reintegrated into the old setting that landed them with us in the first place. And I'd just like to ask you guys to consider a reintegration plan. I, for one, would be willing, along with my new duties as a teacher elsewhere, to help integrate the students back into their traditional settings. I suggest that we have one teacher at least or, or somebody they're comfortable with at each of the high schools to walk them through their schedule, make sure they're showing up. I also, Miss um, Jackson, have a sign in my yard. It's still there. I want to see them go to every day. I asked every one of them when they came in here if they showed up today. I'm scared that they won't. And I would be willing to help with the reintegration plan. Thank you Thank for your you. time. Tracy Buckner. Tracy Buckner. Excuse me, I have to gain my composure after that one. I'm Tracy Buckley. I'm a teacher at the Safe School. Hopefully I don't take up all my time breathing. <laughs> um, Woodruff Career and Technical Center has seen many shifts in administrative personnel. In the six years that the school has been open, has been known, it has known five different principals and at least 15 assistant principals, some of whom were moved and reassigned by the district. Each time WCT students and staff have had to adjust to the differences in philosophies and personalities. These transitions are not easy. At the end of the 2015-2016 school year, we received Dr. Lockbon Janovitz. Having heard the rumors that she is the type to get things done, our staff joined hands in unity to re-envision the contemporary and safe schools. We presented our visions to several administrators. Our vision was accepted and steps were being made and hope is restored for a new journey in the 2016-17 school year. As is the case with the beginning of a new school year, ours was full of hope and promise to create an even better contemporary program. If you would like to see that vision, please direct inquiries to Greg Gilson, Derek Scott, or myself for the presentation that was given last year that you may have not been able to attend to see. Dr. Lockbon Janovitz pushed for new policies that would allow the safe school students to transfer to the contemporary school as soon as their expulsion had been lifted. This, for many students, was a blessing. Students who had been in fear to return to their home schools because of gangs, which I think we all know the state of gangs in Peoria right now, they were relieved to find out that this year they could be accepted into the contemporary program, and some of them were this year. So they were relieved of that burden, and they were able to attend in the contemporary pro program. Now that fear will be known again. If your reply to this is that these students have the same options elsewhere, I am so very sorry, but you are wrong. As a teacher for the safe and contem contemporary school for the last two years, I have seen many students transform from their formerly aggressive selves into leaders who aren't afraid to stand for the pledge. I have seen students wrapped in cocoons of insecurity grow into confident adults ready to challenge the world. And I have seen gang members release their burdens in order to live a life they had never imagined possible. To those who believe these students can get the same treatment elsewhere, I am sorry once again, you're wrong. Do great teachers exist outside of Woodruff? Absolutely. But the group, at, the group at Woodruff is a family. We knew the schools as parents know their own children. Students will not receive the same attention elsewhere that they were able to receive at WCTC. The contemporary school was designed to have smaller classes for this purpose. 
A class size of 15 was full capacity. If you were witness to any of these larger class sizes, you would understand why 15 is full capacity. On the contrary, I know that there were at least two teachers. I'm sorry I wasn't able to gather more data than that in the last six days. But I know that there were at least two teachers with class sizes larger than 15. What was so special about WCTC? Excuse me. We are not an institution. We are not just a program. We are a school, a closely knit family that has been able to recognize the greatness in every student and show them that we see in them, what we see in them is something they should see in themselves and we do it every day. This year was different, it was better. It was promising, and we were all doing our parts to ensure the academic and social emotional success of every student in a more intimate setting. I can only hope that by speaking here today, it is understood that wonderful things are happening at Woodruff Career and Technical Center, and that a decision can be made to bring it back to Peoria Public School District 150. Until Thank you, then. Ms. Thank you. I was almost done. Can I just have like 30 more seconds? Okay. Thank you. I'm here today not because I believe what I say will change the inevitable, but because I want our students to see what a civil and peaceful protest looks like, as well as see the support, the love, and the faith that we have had and continue to have in our student body at Woodruff Career and Technical Center. Thank you. We have reached our 20-minute limit, and I would like to um, get consensus from the board to continue uh, with those that have uh, signed up. So move. It's not a motion, sir. I'm, okay, I'm trying well, you to concur. Get it's, then okay, we'll do that. so you you concur, concur. Ms. Jackson? Yes. Ms. Costa. Okay. I concur. Okay. Yes. Yes. And I concur. Okay. Thank you. Next uh, is uh, Sarah Bigger. Members of the school board, Dr. Karat, I thank you for this opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Sarah Bigger, and I also came to address the closing of the Woodruff Contemporary Academy. Uh, I was extremely disappointed when we received the phone call on Tuesday afternoon that the Contemporary Academy was closing one hour before the press release. Um, some of the other parents weren't as lucky as I was to get that phone call. I thought the worst part of the day was having to go home and tell my eighth grade daughter, Olivia, that the school was closing. But actually the worst part was this morning when I took her to her new school. In order for you to understand where I'm coming from, I feel I need to give some background. Um, like the Teaver Boss, Olivia was at Lindbergh Middle School and it was recommended by Lindbergh Middle School that she attend the Contemporary Academy. Fifth grade was a normal year. The end of sixth grade brought bullying, students kicking desks into her, notes left in her locker calling her foul names and telling her to kill herself. We left that behind and started seventh grade and it started off well but in November she was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. Due to her hospital stay, her several doctor's appointments, she became behind in school and not every teacher was willing to work with her to bring her back up to speed. A few months after that um, her father my husband was diagnosed with a serious medical condition, and then my daughter was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. We did reach out to the teachers to try to find ways to assist her. We had meetings to help her get back on track. We had plans that were put into place, followed for a few weeks, and then stopped. After that, those few weeks, the only communication I had with the teachers was when one teacher claimed Olivia stole scissors off her desk. The teacher had the time to email me about stolen scissors, but could not reach out to me to work through her issues and help her become successful in the class. At the end of the year with the seventh grade, uh, potential retention in seventh grade looming, Lindbergh suggested we move Olivia to the Woodruff Contemporary Academy. Olivia is my second child growing through District 150 schools. I myself am a product of District 150 schools as well as my husband. My son graduated in 2015. 
We had never heard of the Woodruff Contemporary Academy until it was brought our, to our attention. The potential of sending my daughter Olivia to this Contemporary Academy made us feel like there was a light at the end of this tunnel. We were excited about the small class sizes, the ability of the teachers to have more time to spend with each student, and we were thrilled when she was accepted. We had the new, new school first day jitters, but things were going extremely well. At the beginning of the second week of school, on a Sunday evening, my phone rang, and it was Olivia's math teacher, Mrs. Thomas, who is the teacher of the year. As a parent with a child who has struggled in school, my first thought was, oh my, is she struggling again? Mrs. Thomas called to let me know how much she enjoyed having Olivia in her class. She loved that Olivia was participating every potential chance. She loved the spark that she brought to the class. I had tears in my eyes at the end of that phone call. I haven't ever had a teacher call me to tell me how much they enjoyed either one of my children being in their class. By the second week at Woodruff Contemporary Academy, I had a totally different child. She loved her classes, she loved her teachers, she loved reading. She would come straight home and complete her homework with no prompting. She was more engaged. She would tell me how nice it was to have teachers that truly cared. The students in the class understood everything in the lessons being taught. She found out she learned things differently from other students. And that is why the traditional class setting, classroom setting did not work for her. My childhood made a complete 180 from where she ended the previous school year. She felt confident, she felt valued. We broke the news to her about the closing and she was distraught. She was so upset about going back to the traditional classroom setting. She's anxious about not being able to keep up in her classes because she learns things differently from other students. She's worried about being bullied. She's worried about being singled out for being different. She's worried she will not succeed. We as her parents can only do so much to boost her confidence. We are hoping and praying that we can encourage Olivia enough to stay engaged even when things get hard. We are also hoping and praying that the teachers at Sterling will be able to have the time to teach lessons in a way that all students understand. Because everyone learns things differently. Students like Olivia are the reason the district needs the Contemporary Academy. I understand that there is a teacher shortage in the district. What I do not understand is so many teachers being released from the positions in May and not being brought back. I've talked to multiple teachers at the Contemporary Academy who also teach in the safe school. So there are many, many questions as a parent that I have. How are 14 teachers supposed to help this? Thank These you. questions and many more are the ones that the parents need to know, and I feel the district has made a grievous error in closing the Contemporary Academy. Thank you. Ariana Norris. Ariana Norris. Hello, I'm Ariana Norris. Uh, I'm a senior at, well, was at um, Woods of Career Technical Center. Um, could I ask you, are you over 18? Huh? Are you over 18 years old? Yeah. All right, thank you. And um, today I will be talking among the student's voice, which is the high school part of the contemporary side. Um, it affected us worse than it did the parents because I feel as if you guys have a job. You guys are sitting there in front of us, went through school, went through education, graduated, went through college. When y'all retire, we'll be sitting in y'all same spots. But why not give us that opportunity when you took our home away from us? It's kids that's inside the school that's in foster care. It's a freshman that I met earlier this year that I adapted to just so cleanly, she had the sweetest heart. And she cried because this is her first experience as a high school. She never been to a real high school. I have a best friend that dropped out of school because y'all took her education away from her and that's the only setting that she can actually get her credits in. She's considered as a sophomore and won't be able to graduate and walk across the stage with her class as if she's supposed to. Y'all took a lot away from us. And I wouldn't say y'all, I'd say Dr. Karat took a lot away from us. 
This decision is not on how many teachers we have, how many te students is in the classroom. It's on budget cut. So I feel like you shouldn't sit up here and lie in front of our faces knowing that it don't have nothing to do with the students. Because last time I checked, the reason of a contemporary side is smaller classes and how we learn. I was, a, so I was a freshman and I got expelled from Central. I was on the expel side for a year and a half. Then I went down to the contemporary side because I did not feel safe at Central. Not only that I was being bullied, but only to get my credits. I was behind on my credits. I had to go to credit recovery. Credit recovery is not offered at Central, nor Richwoods. It's after school. Would you have offered it as a class? And I got my credits up to be considered as a senior this year so I could walk across the stage and make my parents proud. My brother had to My brother had to go to summer school just to get his credits to walk across the stage on Knoxville. He was not able to walk across the stage because he didn't have all his credits because he went to Central. And I begged my brother to stay at Woodrow's just so he can walk across the stage, but he didn't want to do it. I had a best friend that was shot and killed at the age of 17 and wasn't able to walk across the stage. I had a friend that just got shot and killed. Not even two weeks ago when I was with him, and he, had, he wasn't able to walk across the stage. And you taking his education away from us is hurting us. It's not hurting our parents. It's not hurting y'all. It's hurting the students. We are y'all future. What happened to no child left behind? Thank you. Is it San, uh, Sandy John, John Jures? Did I pronounce that correctly? John Gerius. John Gerius, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> it's a remarkable day at Peoria Public Schools. Those are the words that we hear when we call any school. And it has been a remarkable week. It is remarkable that as the district creates an office for social emotional learning, it closes the school that has been implementing the ideas of social emotional learning for the past five years. This decision was made without consulting the parents, the staff, the students, or the administrators at the school. And as I stand here, I see Mr. Sierra, who is a product of Woodruff, who gave probably one of the most awesome graduation speeches we've ever heard. <clears throat> it's remarkable that the district states the reason for closing the school is low enrollment and small class size when this was how the school was envisioned at its inception. Additionally, if the district would have taken the time to actually look at past enrollment numbers, they would have seen that for the 2015-16 school year, enrollment increased from 63 students in September of 2015 to 98 students in May of 2016. It is remarkable that the district seems to think that by closing the middle and high school contemporary school, those displaced teachers will fill the vacancies that the district is experiencing. This despite the fact that the majority of those vacancies are in elementary education and special education, positions for which these teachers do not hold the appropriate certification. Most remarkable though is the district's assertion that they want to help students succeed and pursue their dreams. To these middle and high school students who have been bullied, harassed, and or been unsuccessful in a traditional school, their dream may be to be able to attend a school where they feel safe, they can catch up academically, and learn. To all of these students who had begun to realize that dream, and to the many students who may have been considering a move to the contemporary school at WCTC, you have remarkably said to all of them, you don't matter. Thank you. Uh, Savino Sierra, Mr. Sierra.
Take your time. Sabino Sierra, I live in this neck of the woods. Um, I just want to say that I support these parents and uh, whoever's uh, trying to get you people to uh, reconsider and open that program at, at uh, Woodruff because you uh, uh, favor other programs and uh, um, this one's just as important and there's other things that you can uh, cut you know like uh, unnecessary trips you know what do you when you go on these trips what do you bring back I've never very seldom I hear anything uh, that's uh, new, newsworthy or help helping in the um, in the school with uh, programs um, what I usually talk about is the discipline we still haven't uh, um, how would I say uh, caught up on that we still uh, are uh, in bad shape you know we have this the um, address code it isn't it isn't uh, adhered to uh, all the way, you know. And uh, there's uh, a lot of grabbing, the, you know, of the uh, between the girls and and the uh, boys. You know what I mean? And I'll admit, a lot of a lot of the time, it's the girls that want the attention, so they'll grab onto the boys, you know, and it just continues right there. So. Uh, you know, you're going to have to do better in uh, in our uh, what do you call it? In our behavior in our schools, and teach them. You know, uh, if you have to get rid of that sex education and and, and uh, do more uh, on the uh, social um, get, um, manners, and uh, you know, I'm. I'm an old timer. A lot of you people uh, haven't been here as long as I have. I was born and raised here in 1931, so and I've seen it deteriorate. So we have to uh, um, get on it and get get more serious. And uh, I, I hate to be complaining again, but uh, it it doesn't. Uh, give us any credit as a school district, you know? And I, I believe that's why a lot of teachers don't wanna come to teach here because they hear it's kind of rough. You know, we had the assistant superintendent at one time, he was a minority, and you people were talking about, we had to get more teachers as a minority, and he went all around all over he took off and he, and he couldn't get teachers, minority teachers to come and teach here. So uh, a lot of people are complaining that we don't have enough minority teachers, but uh, hard, hard to tell why they don't come, but um, we gotta get whoever they are, good teachers, you know. Uh, don't, don't worry about, you know, what color they are. We want good teachers in this district and uh, a lot of it's a, a big uh, plus if they're bilingual, as just like in our police departments, you know. Uh, they want uh, uh, minority people, you know. I said, that's fine, but I want people that are bilingual because there's more uh, citizens that, uh, that uh, you know, Vietnamese uh, uh, and all, all them that uh, don't uh, ex express themselves as plain. So let's, let's look into that too. And with this, oh yeah, and the next time, see if you can't find a better venue because it's, 
pretty hot in here and for <laughs> <laughs> and for no kidding for our older people you know you know i hope you got insurance because i might pass out when i go back to my seat so i want to thank you <laughs> Caleb Connecticut. Board members, Dr. Karad. I was a contemporary student at Woodruff Career and Technical Center. I am a junior, and this program made a lot of differences for me. Where do I start? I did not do well in a traditional classroom. I started off at Peoria Notre Dame as a freshman. I did not do well there, so I transferred to Peoria High at the beginning of my sophomore year. I did not do well there either, so I was recommended to go to, to Woodruff, and I did there, and I succeeded there. And that's the best I've ever done in my life. And these people, I'm talking for all the ones who weren't able to show up today, are like family to me. They never. We all work together, we never, it's, it's hard to explain how much we bonded together as a family and the staff just, they worked with us. You don't get the same one-on-one -on -one as you do in a regular classroom like you did there. And it means a lot. Anything to say? No, I can't think of anything else. All right. Thank you. I'm Chris, I'm Caleb's mother. Um, since he hasn't used all of his time. Um, he was failing in traditional school. He went to Woodruff and it has made all the difference. He's gone from failing to having straight A's. He looks forward to school for the first time ever. Um, when I ask how his school day is, I get more than fine. He comes home willing to talk about his day. Um, all of his teachers, especially Mr. Scott, you know, give one-on-one -on -one individualized attention, really care about these kids and going back into the traditional classroom is not the place for them. I, I, I hope that they succeed, but I really feel that a, a school like Woodruff is where they need to be. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. I know I didn't have your name. Down. <laughs> Caleb, could you give us your mom's name, please? Your name was on the card. Faith Rivers. Hello, my name is Faith Rivers. I was a student at Woodruff Techno Career Center, where we used to be. Um, I would like to speak. Um, I thought this, this was wrong because with school I came from, Central. I couldn't focus, my grades was going down. I had a lot of trouble with people. I was getting into fights, was not focusing in class. The teacher would explain the work, but it wouldn't be enough for me. I needed someone to explain it more. And at Woodruff, they did that. And when I went there, I'm like, wow, he's actually sitting down working with me. As a teacher, I thought their job was just to get up there and show us the work, um, explain it as best as they could. Teachers at Woodruff did not do that. They sat down with us, they explained it. They learned new things they didn't even know they could do once they sat down and worked with us. <laughs> I think that was great. I, my eyes opened up. And some of the kids that go to Woodruff would be their first generation that would graduate out of their family. Some of, some of our parents didn't get the education we're getting today, and especially about our history. Where we come from, there is very little of us who make it either out of high school or drop up in grade school. 
knowing my great grandmother and my grandma tell me their stories makes me want to do better. But you guys taking this school away from us. I thought that District 150 is supposed to provide us for what we need and not take it away. I thought that District 150 was supposed to be there for us. I dream big. We all students dream big. But some of our dreams we cannot reach without a high school degree. Some of us don't do right in math class reading. Some of us are having a hard time reading. At Central, they have North across the street. But I don't think that does better. It makes it worse. Small classes helps me. I think it is great. I thank the teachers for putting out their time to sit down with me and explain my work I would like to say thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Wigner. <laughs> Next, I have uh, Ms. I'm, I'm Ms. Faith, the grandmother. Antoinette Jones. Yes, I'm right. Faith, the grandmother. Um, her first year and her sister's first year was at Central last year, and um, they didn't do good um, with their grading. Um, it was a lot going on, and she do have a problem focusing. Um, at the last day of school, what, um, they got chased to my job, Valeska Hinton, by a mob of children, and I thought that I need to move them. Um, I kind of was disappointed because the way I found out about it, I went to work and my the teacher I teach with said, oh, the, they closed in Woodruff. How is that going to affect you? I said, oh, no, they're not closed in Woodruff. It's a heat schedule. <laughs> <laughs> so she said, no, they're closing it. So I made a couple of phone calls, and then they came home with the letter the next day. Um, now today they went to Centrum. Um, the other, my other granddaughter, she's back there. She's taking hair braiding, and Faith came to my job by herself, and I said, "Well, where is Destiny?" And she said, "She's at Woodruff." And then Destiny eventually called and said, "She's at Centrum," and she took the bus, I guess, back to Centrum, and the buses was gone. So I was kind of upset about that, but. Um, I don't know the whole scenario of the story, and I think everybody pretty much, you know, said everything. I just was concerned about how it was done, concerned about my children's safety, concerned about what programs been put in place to help these children meet them where they at and take them where they need to go. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Gilson. First off, I'd like the audience to give the students a round of applause for braving this. What is a teachable moment? It is an opportunity to shed light on a moment when relevant learning can occur. A teachable moment is an unplanned opportunity that arises in the classroom where the teacher has an ideal chance to offer insight to his or her students. A teachable moment is not something you can plan for. Rather, it is a fleeting opportunity that must be sensed and seized by a teacher. What is the teachable moment here? When students asked me that, when students asked me what was going on when they arrived at school last Wednesday, I couldn't answer them. 
If I take an economics view, which I teach, as the lens to view this, the insight I offer is that business and businesses and households are individual entities that have to make decisions on the micro level, and that governments must make decisions based on the macro level, the aggregate level. However, this decision, these decisions must be done with different factors in mind. I could settle on looking at the opportunity cost of a decision, that is, the next best alternative to a choice made. What is the opportunity cost of closing down the contemporary school? Placing kids back in an environment where they struggle or where they were unsuccessful? As I walked through the fog of this past week, I had a hard time finding clarity, a hard time finding that teachable moment. My wife and I talk to our children about what they want to be when they grow up. I look at teaching as a noble profession, and I feel there is a need for good teachers always. When my daughter says she wants to be a teacher, my wife will say, what about a doctor or a lawyer? I defend teaching, but you see, my wife has come to the realization that the educational system is on a downward path. She was an educator and has witnessed this firsthand, as I have prior to coming to this district. My family is going through a hard time right now. My kids sense something is awry. With my faith in publication, public education shaken, what should I tell my daughter now? What should I tell the aspiring teachers coming through the educational programs, green behind the ears? There's a great poem by Taylor Molly that I will share a little with you right now, but please take the time to watch the whole YouTube video when you get home tonight. The question I leave you with is this, what do teachers make? You want to know what I make? I make kids wonder. I make them question. I make them criticize. I make them apologize and mean it. I make them write. I make them read, read, read. I make them spell definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful, definitely beautiful over and over and over again until they never misspell either one of those words again. I make them show their work in math and hide it on their final drafts in English. I make them understand that if you got this, then you follow this. And if someone ever tries to judge you by what you make, you give them this. Here, let me break it down for you so you know what I say is true. Teachers make a difference. Now, what about you? I was able to do this every day at Woodruff with the kids who truly found a place. Thank you for your time. Charlotte Thomas. Charlotte Thomas. is emotional for me um, I can't express in the words what it has meant to be a teacher at Woodruff a contemporary program um, I have several special needs children that I work with at, at Woodruff who have come there because and as you've heard over and over again they They've not found a place in their traditional setting. Um, and, and that's, it's heartbreaking to know that they're, they're going back to, to that, that type of environment where they were bullied or harassed and where 
even, even though they were special needs, they, they were placed into a classroom of 30 plus kids where those special needs weren't completely met because inclusion doesn't, doesn't always work in a, in a larger setting. And so at Woodruff, they were able to succeed. Um, they were able to get their needs met in a way in which, unfortunately, we can't, we can't provide because of failure to plan. So as a teacher, when I think of planning, you know, I, I plan a lesson before I want to get in front of my students. I think of the outcome. I think of each and every student that I am addressing and, and what their specific needs are. I think of, of what I want them to test on. I want them to, what type of knowledge do they have to obtain? What standard am I teaching to? What, what are the expectations for this lesson? What's the end? And so that's in lesson planning. So if we fail to plan, we're, we plan to fail. That's a popular saying. So if we fail to plan for our students, we plan to fail. If we plan to fail, if we fail to plan as leadership, we plan to fail our students, our communities. We've seen that on the state level where they fail to plan. And that in turn left to failure um, in our public schools. And we, we've seen that on a citywide level where we've failed to plan in terms of providing um, dry community or landlord licensure programs so that we have an adequate tax base for our schools to be successful so that we're not pinching and squeezing here and there. And unfortunately, we've seen that here. You know, uh, I feel like this decision could have been made before the school year began. Had this decision be, been made prior to, the families would have been able to make adjustments. The staff would have been able to make adjustments. We get excited to fill our classrooms, to decorate the, for the first days of school. Money spent out of our own pockets. The excitement in our hearts to see our students, they are our motivation. They are the reason why we do this, why we get up every morning. And, and so I just want everyone to be mindful of that. You know, when you, when you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And unfortunately, those that suffer the most are our children. The, our, the health of a community a great litmus test to that is the health of our schools. And when we look around and see the health of our schools, we can, we can see that our community is failing. There are certain things that we can put into place to see that that is no more, that these communities can be successful, that we can have a healthy tax base. But we have, that takes planning. Thank you for your time. Charlie Thomas. God, see, I retire and look what happens. What a mess. Um, I just like to say to the kids that came out, fantastic job. It's a way to come out and support your school. <laughs> Teachers that are all here, fantastic. It's unbelievable that you come out like this. Unfortunately, I had the very much displeasure of going through this when Woodruff High School closed. I think Ms. Ross was on that board and I'm not sure anybody else was. So she can remember some of this. That was a four to three vote to shut down Woodruff and whatever, you know, that's a done deal. But it brings me back to what bothers me about what's going on now is that was treated pretty much the same way this was treated. No communication. No transparency. Where are those words at? Somehow we lost those. Where'd they go? 
Now, I've been, I haven't been at the board meeting for a while. I've been busy following around my wife, <laughs> making her fantastic speeches. But I do want to say a couple things uh, that don't concern Woodruff. Uh, Mr. Wather, glad to have you. I'm so glad. Um, it, this is a true story. If she hadn't won uh, Illinois State Teacher of the Year, I was going to run for that position. So, <laughs> no, that's a true story. And I am so glad a teacher, an ex-teacher is in that spot. So. Thank you. Now, as, as we look at this whole process, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm going to throw a lot of things out because at least we're back to five, which took forever to get back to five minutes. Um, I'm going to throw a lot of things out. Uh, you know, when you, when Woodruff was set up, all the teachers, a lot of people have already said this, it was set up to make a, a spot for the young kids that aren't feeling comfortable where they were. And it was doing that. It was doing all that. I also taught at Woodruff before I retired, in case anyone didn't know that. I loved it there. My good friend Tom Bloomer was the principal when he called me and says, we have a PE opening. Uh, Mr. Uh, Coach, uh, I, Coach Esos, was going to move up and be an assistant. I jumped at the chance. First of all, I loved Woodruff. But I love working with those kids. I was a basketball coach at Woodruff for 11 years. and. A lot of the same type of kids. I dealt with social and emotional learning before it was, I guess, to be known. You know, we got a social emotional leader now, Mr. Booth, by the way. Mr. Booth's a fantastic guy. But we teachers have been doing that forever. So I, I don't really get starting, we're not starting a social emotional learning situation. It's been going on forever. But now we have a position for that. Well, you know, um, Tom Bloomer was there doing his work. And then all of a sudden, things were going pretty good, and we got to move Tom now. We got to move principals all over the place. Tom's doing a great job. Now he's got to go to Lincoln because, unfortunately, somebody at Lincoln wasn't doing their job. How about everybody do their job? That would have been nice. You know, somebody said it how many principals' administration changes that those kids and those teachers had to go through. And they're still willing to fight it out and stay right there because they all love those kids. That's what it's about. They love the kids. It's not about pay. We all know it's not about pay. My goodness. Now, you know, I, I follow the papers. I read the board minutes. I talk to Terry if I miss. Find out what's going on at the board meetings. Well, we re-upped elite. Okay, we re-upped elite. Good or bad, I don't know. But those elite people over there at Lincoln, it seems to me if they want to be teachers and be around kids, go to college. We could sure use you as a teacher. Go back, get your degree. We'd love to have you. But that's a program we spend a lot of money on. I don't get it sometimes, the way these decisions are made. You know, and the two, two young teachers from Woodruff that got up there, those are the kind of teachers you're going to run off. Great young teachers that will make a difference. You're going to run them off because of silly decisions. And not having a contract, how do we not have a contract? Of course, I've been through this before. Went all the way to January. I think that's the record. Hopefully that doesn't happen. I know J uh, Jeff is working real hard on that issue. It's just a shame. You know, like I said, it's, it's a deja vu for me, you know, seeing Woodruff go through this mess again. And a lot of the things that were said then are being said now. You know, I, I listen to these parents and... I had some of these students, and they're, they're such neat kids. Yes, they have individual situations that need to be addressed, but that's what teachers do every day. You know, when the building opens in the morning, the only people you need there, really, custodians, number one. <laughs> we know that. Teachers and students. Everybody else can stay home, because that's who handles the building. And, you know, all these openings we have, how many interventionists do we have in the district? How many AIOs? Thank you, I think they're all Thomas. certified in something, aren't they? Thank you. Terry Knapp. Mr. Knapp. Can't follow any of these people, believe me. I'd like to say this three times. Choice. 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 We're here so the people can have a choice. Like say this three times. Referendum. 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 You want to pass a referendum and you're doing this? 
Are you serious? This is the same thing that happened at Woodruff. You know, you went in, and I hand this to Debbie Wolfmeyer and Laura Patel and the other two people, I don't even remember who voted, four to three to close Woodruff, because they didn't have enough students. 900, 200 seniors, totally displaced, so that Glenn Barton and what's her face from the Chamber of Commerce, Rob Parks, could have their, could have their charter school, which is miserably failing. Had 75 kids in a freshman class, graduated 39, 36 disappeared. Where did they go? Nobody wants to look at that. I've asked that at other school board meetings. Nobody's going to look at that. They don't want to close that school. They didn't want to close Edison until Edison floated the IPO and went to $38 a share and then went to $0.14 cents a share, and they got rid of Edison because it wasn't doing anything but taking money out of this community in cartloads. $17 million directly to the company and another $30 million spent in overtime for teachers. Didn't do anything except provide an extra hour a day for the, for the students and their parents. It's important that you understand that Woodruff was destroyed. The north side was destroyed. When you closed Woodruff, you put half the kids on a bus going to Central who never rode the bus. They walked to school. The other kids on the other side of the street to Taft Homes got put on a bus down to Manuel. Didn't do anything. And, and somebody said, oh, we're going to help these kids transition. Dr. Williamson's going to help these kids transition. Bull. Those kids, the cheerleader that I knew across the street from Woodruff, didn't even make the cheerleading team at Manuel. That's a sin. She went to Richwoods, went to live with her grandmother, and was run out the first day because she had a ham camisole on, and the dean told her she, her boobs were too big to go back to class. I've told you that story before. That was the transition. Didn't go to homecoming dance, didn't go to the prom, didn't go to anything, didn't cheerlead at Richwoods. Wasted her whole senior year. She's a mess today. Okay, I saw her this morning. She's a total mess because we didn't take care of those kids on the north end. We gave Glenn Barton the fourth high school with, with 36 or 39 seniors. Next year, they've already down to 53 juniors. Where do those kids go? They just counsel them out, send them back to the schools. They don't care about them. They're numbers for, for Quest Academy. Valeska Hinton, I have asked for the research on Valeska Hinton for, for 10 years. We got 20, we got six graduating classes from Valeska Hinton. Show me the second, the third graders and fourth graders went to Valeska Hinton that achieved and where they went when they graduated from high school. That's easy to track. Refuse to track it. We spend two million dollars a year on three and four year olds that we could use for these programs. Three and four, two and three million dollars a year goes to those two and three year olds or three and four year olds, I'm sorry. And what do they do with it? They take it away from other kids in our district. It's sad. We don't even look at that program because we know we can't touch Valeska Hinton. We can't touch uh, the, the, the uh, Quest Academy, who's getting $6 million a year or $5.5 million a year from our district coffers. It's sad. But these kids are costing us what? A couple hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars. I thank you, Dr. Crock, for, for making the adjustments and not sending $250,000 worth of teachers to Orlando, Florida. That's a great move. I thank you for trying to reduce the legal fees, but I don't thank you for this. I mean, this, you should have had this thing long before you even considered closing the school, just like you didn't have a meeting on the north end with the Peoria, or the, excuse me, the uh, Averyville Kingman, the oldest neighborhood association in Peoria, didn't even get a meeting with the Board of Education. Four to three, close Woodruff. Goodbye. Sharon Cruz. I learned long ago that teachers who move up the ladder quickly morph into principals, administrators, and superintendents. Teachers and administrators are never going to agree wholeheartedly because each group approaches educational problems from a different perspective. The best we can hope for are board members willing to listen to teachers and other stakeholders. Listening is only the beginning. The results of listening must be compromise. And that is the case with proximity learning. 
which I expected to be on tonight's agenda since there had been no vote yet. I fear that once again, momentous decisions are being made with little input from teachers and little discussion and no vote from the board. The board members who were or are teachers and the student mem board member gave opinions that prove they understand that teacher-student interactions and student interactions with each other are valuable components of the learning process. Of course, the board is mainly interested in finding a solution for the, uh, for the unfilled teaching positions. Manuel has once again been chosen as the guinea pig. From 1974 through 2007, a significant number of dedicated, experienced manual teachers retired, five of us from the English department. And we were replaced by very competent teachers who also loved manual and its students. Then in 2008, in order to acquire thousands of dollars, the board chose a grant that required that over half the faculty be exchanged for either new, inexperienced, or new to manual teachers. There were few familiar faces to greet students as they entered Manuel's classrooms that year. Much continuity and much of Manuel's history were lost. Manuel has not had a stable faculty since then. Students were and are the losers. To make matters worse, the grant led to the board's selection of block schedule program that exposed students to English, math, science, and social studies classes for only one semester, leaving them with a semester and a summer, seven months to forget much of what they had learned. Four years of students were deprived of adequate learning opportunities just when No Child Left Behind testing was at its height. No wonder manual students did not do well on the tests. Dr. Karat, you were given the task of supporting the program and making it work. A year later, you stood at this podium to tell the board that they and the superintendent were not supporting your program. I believe your requests were ignored. Now the roles are reversed. Please heed tonight's requests. I hear talk about the importance of teacher-parent connections, but the proximity program will make it impossible for that connection. There will be no teacher to call teachers to call parents or to meet with parents at open house or any other time. You can't hear me now because you are worried about the serious problems facing the district as a result of ignoring years of warnings about laying off teachers at the end of the year. I can only imagine the total number of teachers that have found other jobs over the years instead of waiting for the district to recall them. There is no hope for this district if you are not willing to admit to and find solutions for all the reasons why new teachers are not drawn to this district. At the last meeting, three exemplary manual grads, Derek Booth, Jeff Atkins Dutro, Bernice Gordon Young, stood at this podium. They should be a reminder to all of you that today's manual students deserve the same opportunities those graduates were given, the right to a stable faculty with which to build enduring relationships. Please don't continue to further harm manual students. Now you also have to deal with the complaints from Woodruff teachers and parents. Congratulations to Alex. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie Petty. Good evening. My name is Jackie Petty, and I want to talk about an experience I had this past Saturday. I attended the Lincoln Branch Library to view the documentary Selma, The Bridge to the Ballot. The true story of the 1965 Selma to Montgomery voting rights march. I would like to recommend that this documentary should be shown in our schools. It is sad, but this is history that our students are not receiving. And I'm not recommending that it be shown in February 
Black History Month. How about this month? When I found out that civic classes had been dropped at one time in our schools, that explained to me why we're seeing so much apathy among our young adults. They don't know their history. They know nothing about the process. I will leave information with you tonight on where you can get this video. It's free for schools and teachers. And by all means, the civic classes should be showing the documentary. When I attended uh, Peoria High School many, many years ago, we had to pass the Constitution test to graduate. My civic teacher took each of his classes to one of the civic board meetings, such as the school district, the park district, the county board, or city council. We were there for the entire meeting, too. So it is my hope tonight that word to the wise is sufficient. Thank you. Uh, Kim Thomas. W O O D R U F F spells best school ever. What makes Woodruff the best school? Not only the students and this amazing staff that I love and call family, but every student at Woodruff fits in. Every single one of them fit in. I mean, you know, some of them little quirks, but they fit in. I got kids blurting out words. That's okay. I'll blurt them out in a few minutes, too. They fit in. They feel safe. They love it there. And so do their teachers. They, they fit in. And then we just send them off. Um, you know, th this is what happened. Tuesday, after sweating and being a puddle of goo so you can take how hot you are and multiply by 50. <laughs> we we were called into um in the, into the library and dr ike i think it's the first time i met you so i hope i'm saying it right is in there and i i didn't know him so i walk up i was introducing myself i said hello i'm kim thomas welcome to heaven on earth and he goes hello and said his name i sat down you know, i'm all excited I had a great mathlicious day you know everything's going well and boy, did he just tore my heart out for these kids. First thing, I, I put my hand up. I was like, what about the kids? What are we going to do? Are you telling me, you are telling parents now and teachers. And my thing is like, I was so shocked because SEL, that's what this school is about. Every single student I had, God love them, have some SEL issue. That's what the, I was like, let's fill it up. We filled up manual. We took away the Harrison 7th and 8th, the Tree Wind 7th and 8th, and put it right into manual. You know, if you sent, I bet Derek Booth to every single middle school, every principal would say, hey, here's five kids, take them. They would, they would fit in at Woodruff. Have him go to the parents' homes and say, hey, we got this program. I think this would maybe really fit the need of your kid. We didn't even try. What upsets me, and you know, obviously it breaks my heart for kids, because they, my mess, sons and daughters, you messed with them. And oh, did that just break my heart. But no one even said anything to any staff member. Do you know I still don't have a list of where I can go? We showed up today, and I was fortunate because no one applied to do the safe middle school math. So I said, hey, bring them on down to Mathlicious land. I've done safe school for the past, what, like square root of nine years. I'll take them too. So. We, uh, they brought them down, had a math lesson. It was great. Introduced myself, cheered for them all. Then after school, I find out, okay, now we're just going to have one math teacher 6 through 12 at the safe school, one social studies teacher 6 through 12 at the, uh, the safe school. So all these subjects at the safe school, and I'm going, what? Now we're going to make the safe school unsafe. Because, and those middle school students are not going to get the same amount of instruction as the other kids in the city.
Do we care about them? Well, I sure do. I love giving those kids that second chance because some kids need it. Some kids also, the ones, on, you know, the, the safe school kids need that be, being able to be like, okay, you know what? I'm ahead of that contemporary school. I'm ahead of that. that that's going to be my goal because sometimes we just need little goals. We can't look at a huge, you know, little goals for kids. And what was really sad, do you know the square root of 25 kids enrolled on Tuesday and were told Tuesday night, see ya? That is very, I, I just wanted, like, talk to us. Communication. You know, the teacher shortage, teachers go into teaching, like my husband, because they love kids, not because of money. And they don't even quit because of money. Teachers leave and quit because they are not treated like the professionals that they are. That is exact, and trust me, I know, I've been around this, you know, I've been so proud to represent this district and this state. And I'm like, how do you not even just bring us together? Okay, you know what? We might have to close you, but do you guys have any suggestions on how maybe we could fill this up? How about we talk and communicate? Then we know. And also, the, the planning. Well, how about at a normal break? Okay, you started the school. Okay, how about at, at least nine weeks? Or maybe Christmas? If this was the only solution you could come up with. Because this, this just throwing them in. And then today, you know, like I said, teachers show up. We don't have kids. I mean, I did. I took, you know, safe school kids. But now I'm finding out I might not be even able to do that. So now i got to leave some more math children. I mean, we have got to get a plan settled. If you wanted to close a school, you just should have had a plan. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Right. Rochelle Washington. Rochelle Washington. Is Rochelle Washington still here? You want to come on up? Good evening. Good evening. I'm Rochelle Washington. I'm here. Uh, last year, my kids started this district. Uh, I went to this district. Ms. Corral was my assistant principal when I was coming here. Um, my son is autistic. Uh, he came from Pleasant Valley School District, which was 10 times better. But um, I'm here because they moved him to Tree Wind. Um, his IEP is not getting followed. Um, it just seemed like he was just pushed into this classroom. It's not adequate for them. It's not adequate for them. They um, do not have the equipment that they need to, you know, take care of my son. Um, I have left a message with Ms. Karat and, ex and, you know, expressed my concerns. Um, and just watching him, you know, daily go through school and the struggles that they have, they play gym in the hallway. So it's like, you know, it's just a lot of things that um, I was told that they were going to come to the classrooms and see about the classrooms and nobody has ever came to you know, check up on it, see, you know, how the things are going in the classroom. And as I see further along the line with him being autistic and being a special need program, it just seemed like it's going to get worse, you know, for him, you know, going through this district. So then I had to contemplate on moving back into Pleasant, this Pleasant Valley District or moving out of the state period in order for him to go somewhere to get adequate uh, schooling and education. So I'm here in hopes of getting Tree Wind the help that they need and possibly, you know, getting them assistance in the things that's going on with their classroom because they do not have the adequate uh, things for an autistic child there. And I'm watching my child suffer from it and it's, it's pretty sad. So that's what I'm here for. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anything any board member would like to add or speak on? Regarding this issue? Uh, was this time for board response? Yeah. I, just, I didn't hear what you said. Yes, okay. any response? Um, yeah, my name is Dan Walter, um, newly elected board member. Um, I do have a couple of responses to the audience tonight. Um, Dr. Bob. David Avilas and I went down to Woodruff last Thursday and we happened to meet with some of the students and some of the faculty there. Uh, he could speak for himself. I was incredibly impressed 
by the students, uh, how sincere they were about how valuable Woodruff was to them. And you guys have just reflected that tonight. Um, I have received phone calls from staff and parents in regards to this issue. Um, and there were a lot of questions I can't answer. Uh, first of all, the very first person that spoke here, the young lady up front, asked she wanted some answers from the board. Um, I'd like to give you those answers, but we weren't involved in this decision. Make that real clear. This decision was made by the administration. Uh, there was another gentleman that said he had some uh, remarks about Mrs. Ross and things she had said in the paper. I want to make this real clear. Um, I have some issues here. I really still fully support Dr. Karat. But that doesn't mean good people can't make bad decisions. And uh, I think, I don't think we could have messed up this closing of Woodruff any more than we did. For the very reasons that you've all talked about, um, we needed to have dialogue with the parents, with the staff, and with the board before this decision was made. And um, that wasn't done. And uh, I got to point fingers, but the fact is it wasn't done. Uh, the question, the first question I got to ask almost repeatedly is why did we have to do this in four days? Um, I'm confident that there'll be somebody here at the DS that will explain that. I can't. I don't know why it had to be done in four days. Uh, I am really concerned about the students because I think you guys have shown out. We had a program, and I agree with you. When I first got on board, I didn't know how the contemporary school worked either. I mean, it's one of the best kept secrets we've had. And we have an emotional learning program that works. And what do we do? We get rid of it. Um, so I don't understand that part either. And there'll be some people here. And one of the things I'm going to say, too, I'm speaking just on behalf of me. I'm not speaking on behalf of the board. Um, Mrs. President Ross does that. She's the president of the board. I'm just reflecting my own personal opinion. So I don't want anybody to understand that I'm speaking on behalf of everybody here. We have some very bright, hardworking people here. But uh, I'm often asked by other board members, you know, we need to do this for the kids. And I agree. I think we need to do this for the kids. And uh, I think I'll turn this back over to some other people here. But I want to thank again the students and the faculty for coming up here and speaking. It's not easy uh, to do public speaking. We had some people here who supposedly had some disabilities but did some public speaking better than a lot of us who have been around for a long time. And, uh, I'm I'm grateful for your participation. I think we should have had this before this decision was made. Um, but that isn't there. So uh, what I'm going to do is uh, those are my comments for tonight. And I'm going to turn this over. If there are any other board members that have any comments, I'll go to them. Otherwise, Mr. I'm done. Sierra, did you have your hand up? Yes, I did. OK. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Alex Sierra. I'm one of the first of three um, student board members for Peoria Public Schools. and. I would like to reflect upon the matter of the closing of the contemporary school at Woodruff Career Technical Institute. Um, I strongly disagree with the closing of it. I believe, as um, Mr. Adler said, it wasn't handled the right, um, in the correct manner. Reason being is the board wasn't involved, and I feel like the community wasn't involved either. The taxpayers weren't involved. The people who contribute to our educational institutions weren't involved, and that's an issue to me because that's why I'm up here to represent the community. Um, also, I believe that with this being the second closing within the Wood Woodruff Institute, it is a sign of inconsistency, inconsistency and instability within our district. And that's why people leave. Um, sorry, this is my first time doing this. <laughs> um, as well as, from my understanding, the contemporary school is being closed due to low enro enrollment. But one of the main reasons that the contemporary school was generated was for students to conduct themselves in a more successful manner, being in a low enrolled classroom setting. Um, if in <laughs> I believe if um, the low enrollment concern was expressed with everyone, one of the alternate solutions that we could have seeked was the social enrollment social and emotional program that we, the district has started, led by um, Mr. Derek Booth. If um, reason being is because we could refer more kids who have trouble learning in bigger classes to this program, which would have kept the school open. Um, like, I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, like previously mentioned, I am a product of Woodruff Career Technical Center. Um, I was expelled eighth grade year and then sent to Woodruff. Um, I find it a blessing that students can now, or did, 
have the opportunity to go to the contemporary setting. Um, for me, myself, it didn't take me long to realize that I was going down the wrong path, and Woodruff helped me realize that. Um, for other students, it might have taken long or taken longer, which was a good reason to offer them to go to the contemporary setting. That way, they could set their lives up for success. Um, and just to show how successful Woodruff has influenced students, me being um, expelled my eighth grade year um, in a total of more than 11 suspensions before I was expelled in one year, and then being sent to Woodruff, then realizing that it wasn't for me. I was expelled for um, the second semester of my eighth grade year and the first semester of my freshman year, but I did so well that when I, um, wrote a statement to the board, they allowed me to come back into District 150. Immediately bouncing back, um, being first in my class at Manual Academy, and having an offer to an Ivy League school at Georgetown University. That's what Woodruff had done. Um, with that being said, I would like to emphasize on how important it is to have parental and student involvement before matters like this occur because then we feel like we're being left out. So I would like to um, say to keep it up and I hope to see everyone's faces more because your voice does matter. Um, um, going back to another comment that was made about the um, temperature within the school settings. Um, this previous Thursday, it was 78 degrees outside, which is fairly cool for a lot of people outside of the um, educational um, institutions. Me for one, it wasn't. Thursday I re, um, was transported to the hospital due to me passing out in the classroom setting because it was too hot. Realized that we only had heat scheduled for Tuesday and Thursday, which was wrong. Um, in the school itself, it was 91 degrees. Um, I'm asthmatic, like I said, it was very hot. I fainted. Um, it was a result in my um, blood pressure dropping. So that's an issue too. I need, um, for me, I feel like everyone needs to step in the students and the teachers' shoes and realize um, the conditions that the teachers and students have to sit through. And other than that, that's all I have to say. Anyone else have any comments? Dr. Bob? I hardly know where to begin. I accompanied Mr. Walter to Woodruff, the German and the Mexican, traveling together, visiting schools. Woodruff was on our list. And I, too, was impressed by this. You know, we, we walked in to where the students were eating lunch and didn't have to say anything. They came to us, and they were polite, assertive. They had clear thoughts. Um, and I saw a couple of students here. Um, I wanted to point out to you, there was one um, young woman who spoke. She, Ariana, was her name? And she, hmm? There you are. <laughs> Where's your friend, your freshman friend? The reason I'm pointing that out is because Ariana was there, and there was another young lady, a student, who was a freshman just starting. And Ariana had taken her under her wing and was acting. She said, I'm a graduating senior. And she didn't use the word mentor, but she sure acted like it. To the students who are here, to the parents who have made comments, I want to make one thing very, very clear. People can disagree without being disagreeable. We can chip away at ideas, not at people. Now, I'm in disagreement with Dr. Damilon Karat. She and I have been friends and colleagues for nearly 20 years. I suspect this will not be the last time that we are in disagreement because with the positions that you're in come great responsibilities. And from time to time with great responsibilities, you stub your toe. 
I think this could have been handled better for all the reasons that you have said. We had a long conversation, Dr. Damoulin Karat and I, and I want to tell you, especially for the students, what you are seeing now amongst us is healthy. We are professional. We're talking about important things in a way that we can listen to one another. What's happening here is hard for us, but I, I, I hope you are seeing that we're engaged in this in a way that one, seeks to look for solutions, and, and two, causes us to think differently in the future. Here's something I hope that we can take away. Rather than just leaving it at talking about the problems, there's a way to solve these things. As some of you alluded, these problems did not start this year. The idea that we don't have enough teaching staff started long ago. There's a story when I teach leadership at Bradley University. It's a story about a factory, and the factory has a manager and an assistant manager, and the manager is a systems thinker. That means that person doesn't look at individual events, but looks at things happening as a result of one thing causing another, of dominoes falling, of, of things interacting. They walked into the faculty, the, 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 the factory uh, uh, floor, and they saw a grease spot. The assistant manager said, somebody clean up that grease spot. The manager says, okay. How'd the grease spot get there? That valve's not working. The assistant manager said, somebody go and repair that valve. Manager said, how'd that valve stop working? Assistant manager said, well, a while back, you gave us a directive to save money and find the lowest cost valves we could find. Perhaps in the future, we can look at this as a systems issue and begin making, and we've talked about this before, begin making forward-thinking decisions and not waiting for consequences, but being agile and anticipating them. Now, as far as this is concerned, I have a list of letters that have been written to the superintendent. They'll be responded to. What I am hopeful is that we will follow up with every single child and that I can come to you in six months or a year from now, and if you ask me what happened to Ariana, what happened to, making up a name, Benjamin, I'll be able to tell you because I'll be following the systems thinking and following where these students are and how they're doing in their new places. This is a very, very, very difficult decision. Um, originally, looking at it, I thought I understood. However, as I listened to these students, and the passion that they have, I'm wondering, is there another way? I do understand that the classrooms are small and that there are, I want to, is it 16 teachers? Which kind of averages out to like four, four children, four students per teacher. That does seem like a lot. It just does seem like a lot. Would you just, I'm would sorry. you let me, let me talk, order. please? Point of order, please. Um, I'm not saying that, that there are only four students. I'm just giving an average. If you take the 65 students 
and divided by the number of teachers. That's all I'm saying. I look at it from the perspective of these kids, and the kids make a tremendous difference to me. Um, I never want to set a child up for failure. I understand the predicament that, that we're in with the teachers. I understand it fully. Would I like to see if there's a better way to do it? Mrs. Ross always says that we, um, we don't do a good enough job of telling our own story. And so what I'm hearing tonight is a lot of people saying, I didn't even know about the contemporary school. We have a lot of issues in this district with, with uh, discipline. We have a lot of issues with children that have special needs. Maybe we should have done a better job at possibly placing them in an environment in which they would succeed. I appreciate wholeheartedly what Dr. Karat is, is wanting to do. However, my heart says, is, it, is this the right thing? If you can make the difference in one child, then it's not in vain. So I would just like to see if there is a better way that we can do this, if there's a better way that we can utilize the teachers, if we could expand the student body there, because there definitely is a need throughout this district that more children could benefit from what is being done at the contemporary school. You all know for yourself I don't talk a lot. But if something is, is close to me, then I speak it. I'm hoping that, that we can do something that will not hurt these children. And when I say hurt them, if you have children that no longer want to do something, if you have children that no longer want to go to school because they're being displaced, if you have children that have been bullied, just don't adapt. We need some place for them to go. I may not be a pop this may not be a popular decision and at this particular point in time I really don't care, but up to, to me it's all about these kids. Yeah, I, I listen intently, took a lot of notes. Uh, Want to make sure I knew exactly uh, from both sides uh, what is going on. Um, knowing that the administration has the right to make the, these kinds of decisions. Uh, and what we tried to do is look at it and uh, try to understand, because I don't think anyone sitting around this table don't care about children. I would not be sitting here if I didn't care about children. Um, I've always worked with children, have been working in this district as a citizen since I was 13 years old when the Civil Rights Movement was going on and we did sit-ins and lay-ins to uh, segregate, to desegregate the schools. So I probably know more about what is going on uh, regarding make good decisions for our children. I've seen us make some really bad decisions, uh, and they were hard to go back and correct. Uh, 
I believe that if, in fact, uh, this, this board sees that the decision that Dr. Karat made or her staff made, we can correct it. Uh, if we believe that it's the right decision, we can move forward and do what we need to do. Um, and I don't want anyone leaving this room and believe that whatever decision we make uh, or whatever decision I make isn't made to the detriment of children and teachers. Those two groups are the most important people that I think in this district. Uh, we hired Dr. Correct to do the job and she's gonna have to make some other hard decisions. And every decision that she makes, we can't shoot down all the time. That being said, I don't think anybody's sitting around this table really have come to a firm decision on what to do. I think we need to really dissect everything to make sure that whatever we do is the right thing to do for our students and our teachers. Uh, and rest assured that when I make a decision, it's going to be based on those two things and nothing else. Um, I don't believe that the decision that this administration made was made to hurt anyone, children or teachers. It was made because we have a specific problem that we're trying to correct. And I'm sure that Dr. Karat, Karat and her staff made those decisions based on what they believe is best for this district. Then it gets back to, well, what does the board say? Do they believe that this is the right move to make? I believe that whatever move we make is going to be the right decision. And we based on our kids and our staff. Uh, I have not made any decision about anything one way or the other. If I did, I'd tell you. But I want to decipher to all the things you said, and I've got about 15 pages of notes. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I don't take this lightly, and I don't think anybody around this room takes it lightly, and certainly I don't believe Dr. Karad and her staff took this lightly. So I want you to leave this room understanding I know some of you said, our kid, you, you're making so our kids don't matter. That's wrong, because kids do matter. Our kids in District 150 do matter. I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't believe that. So as we move forward, I think we're going to have to really decipher this, talk through it, see what is best for this district. And that's where I believe we need to go, what's best for the district. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, uh, certainly a uh, uh, tense moment, a lot of passionate speeches, um, probably tensest meeting that I personally participated in. I'm sure uh, not uncommon across uh, public schools across the nation. And certainly uh, Mr. Knapp and Mrs. Cruz Mr. Sierra could share that uh, not the first one this district has um, participated in. Uh, I think what matters most uh, from here uh, is how we choose to react to it. Um, and, I, and I think kind of two basic realities that I walked in here with. One is um, we do have a significant teacher shortage. Uh, we put a lot of pressure on Dr. Karat to go ahead and close it. Um, the other reality is uh, we have a, a lot of displaced families and students um, that are concerned about uh, the future of their kids and how um, they receive education, you know, from this day on. Um, but uh, you know, of the of the time that I've had to work with uh, Dr. Krat, this board, and 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 the whole team, uh, nothing has suggested to me uh, that they aren't willing to uh, collaborate and uh, continue to find 
uh, ways to to meet the needs of all the stakeholders, and and we need all the stakeholders. Um, there's lots of challenges in our district, and we are unlikely to get past uh, any of them without everybody on board. Um, so, Dr. Karat, uh, do you think uh, it would be possible to pull together a collaborative team to, you know, brainstorm and and find some find some common ground and, and opportunity to meet the needs of of the parents and families that have expressed uh, concern here tonight as well as as the district's needs. Thank you, Ms. Adler. Thank you, Mr. Adler, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, I know this is uh, an emotional issue for students and families and staff, and um, you, you know, you just have to sit and respect um, everyone's opinion and listen and learn. It was never the intent to cause discomfort, um, but the decision was made. Um, I heard a lot of, why was this decision made? How was this decision made? So you're looking at the needs of 65 students, let's say 69 students, 70 students whose needs are being met, and yet the district has over 1,500 students whose needs are not being met. And that's the balancing act. Okay. Um, next on the agenda is uh, the uh, information items. Uh, Peoria County Schools Facility Sales Referendum, Ms. Andrea Tatora. Hello, how are you? I'm good. That's totally unfair. You're out of order. I'm sorry, Ms. Tatora. That's okay. Okay. Give people time to walk out. Of course. I think we have a short presentation, do we? Thank you for having me here tonight. Um, as you met, you got my name put right. Put your mic on. Put your mic up a little. Is that there better? There you go. Okay. That's better. Uh, I'm Andrea Tortora. I'm a parent in the district. I have a child at Keller and one at Washington. And I'm here tonight uh, because I'm working with the campaign for the Peoria County School Facility Sales Tax. I wanted to kind of give you an update on the work that the campaign is doing. Uh, I'm helping to coordinate communications. I've been meeting with um, more people than I've ever met in Peoria in the six years we've lived here. And it's been very eye-opening to hear the thoughts and opinions of a variety of parents, district constituents, business owners, and community leaders, not only in the Peoria Public Schools District, but from throughout the county. Uh, I think, as you heard tonight, everyone is very passionate about making sure that we have schools where students receive the education that they need and deserve in buildings that uh, respect that education that we want to give them. Um, I have a PowerPoint. Mr. Adler and I have shared this with the Government Affairs Committee at the Peoria Chamber, and we'll be sharing it with a variety of other groups between now and Election Day. I want to let you know that we have a growing group of volunteers who will be helping us get the word out. We will soon have yard signs available. We're exploring options for uh, media campaigns. We'll be doing door-to-door -door canvassing. We will need volunteers. I hope, school board members, that you can join us on some of these activities. We are presenting to every PTO that will have us. Many PTO members are supporting us in 
the volunteer efforts. We even have um, students from some of the key clubs coming out and helping us. We had some students from Peoria High who helped pass out flowers, uh, flyers at the Labor Day Parade, and they were fabulous. We'll be everywhere. Hopefully you'll see us everywhere and be tired of hearing our message, but not too tired to <laughs> go out and vote. So uh, I may be preaching to the choir here a bit, but we wanted to make sure this information gets out. What is the school's facility sales tax? This is a new way to provide for better schools and create jobs across Peoria County. This will be a half percent countywide sales tax. It will generate revenue for school building improvements. This allows investment in aging school buildings that the state budget and local property tax revenue does not allow. We can go to the next one. As you all know, we have many building needs. The average age of a Peoria public school is 58 years old. There are 27 buildings in our district. 19 are older than 50. And the average age of those 19 is 73 years old. We have three schools that are more than 100 years old. Sales tax revenue from this uh, tax, if it's approved, can only be used for capital or building improvements. One investment will impact many schools, not just in Peoria Public Schools, but across the county. 20 school districts will benefit from this. They'll share in $9 million. These funds will benefit more than 27,700 students across the county. And there are hundreds of school building projects planned in all of the districts that will be impacted by this sales tax. Schools receive funds from the sales tax based on the number of students enrolled in each district. So based on our estimates, schools will receive about $644 per student. So the money follows the student. Uh, this is hard to read, but it shows how much money each school district would get per year under this sales tax. Peoria Public Schools would get slightly more than $4 million. Dunlap would get a little bit more than $1 million. IVC would receive uh, around 600,000. Those are the top three. But everyone gets something. Peoria Public Schools has lots of building plans. There are 105 total projects across our 27 buildings that we would like, that you guys could hopefully fund if this sales tax passes. 57 of those projects focus on improved safety. 37 focus on improved building efficiencies. 11 are focused on improved and expanded learning environments. This means a significant improvement for every school building. Uh, this chart lists specific improvements at each building. Uh, if you, I will send this presentation to all of you if anyone wants it and anyone out here who wants it. You can go through those. These are some examples of school investments. New roof, new security doors and entryways, energy efficient windows, more efficient, less costly heating and cooling systems, technology upgrades such as internet and Wi-Fi connections. Many of those improvements will save money. Uh, some of the feedback we received from the people we've spoken to is to be more specific and how will this money benefit schools, how will it save money, and what do we say to people when they say, why do kids need air conditioning? When I went to school, I didn't have air conditioning. Well, this is actually an issue that's been studied, a 2014 study from researchers at the University of Washington in Seattle and the University of California at Berkeley concluded Quote, a building's structural facilities profoundly influence learning. Inadequate lighting, noise, low air quality, and deficient heating in the classroom are significantly related to worse student achievement. So there is a correlation between comfortable room temperatures and physical environments and student outcomes. An earlier study from UCLA found that the achievement gap for students in inadequate buildings is as high as 17%. So, as we've all learned recently, old buildings hold heat for security reasons. Doors at schools today have to remain closed, which means there's no opportunity to create cross-ventilation. 
Heat and humidity, humidity can cause overheating, dehydration, and sluggishness, as you know firsthand. <laughs> and, you know, I would ask anyone who's thinking about not voting for this tax to consider how many of us work in non-air conditioned offices. The timeline for that list of projects is about five summers for our for Peoria Public Schools. It would take five summers to, to complete most of these projects because we can't do most, much of this work when students are in school. We don't want to be disruptive to teachers and students in class. So why should you or anyone in our county support this? As go our public schools, so goes Peoria. Uh, I personally believe, and I, many people who are volunteering for this campaign believe that our schools are the backbone of this city and our region. Without good schools, we lose good families, we lose good businesses. And a decade ago, Mayor Artis made um, that same argument in a piece that he wrote for interbusiness issues. And it was at the time when the district was building the new Glen Oak School. I had just moved to the city, actually, and I thought, what an amazing building. And I had come from a city where community school concepts were the thing. So I was very excited. Um, <laughs> but uh, so I don't have that whole thing memorized. I apologize. <laughs> um, Supporting the sales tax means supporting the. Oh, thanks. I know you have to do this. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, um, more reasons to support this school facility sales tax. It does and will. It will produce a large local investment for Peoria Public Schools. It would be equal or comparable to the investment of two additional Louisville Slugger sports complexes. For the county, the total investment would be bigger than the public investment in East Peoria's levy district. The city of Peoria remains the driving force behind the region's growth. If we believe a quality education is important, we cannot expect it to occur without a quality learning environment. With the public support, we can invest in our schools in ways the state, public, and current property taxes do not allow. So where support comes from? Based on recent census data, the median household income in Peoria County is $51,000, roughly. The IRS estimates that at that income level, the average family in Peoria would pay or does pay about $860 in sales taxes to local, to state and local bodies. If the half percent sales tax goes into effect, this would cost the average family another $52 per year. To me, that seems like a good price to pay for good schools. Uh, whether or not the sales tax pack passes, some work will get done on our school buildings. One way or the other, it will happen. We could do it sooner and cheaper, or we could wait and then have to do it later when these repairs are more expensive. Other work is investment in building a high quality learning environment. I know that our school districts that will benefit from this campaign are committed to fiscal responsibility and efficiency, but cuts are nearing the bone and limiting the ability to problem solve creatively. Would we consider cutting teaching positions to upgrade our buildings? The issue of state funding obviously is a big concern. We were fortunate to get an increase in pledged general state aid this year. Given the condition of the state's budget, we don't expect those increases to hold. Should the state come around to adopting equitable funding reform, their one-time increase made this year will create a larger, larger hurdle to overcome when attempting to not cut anyone's allocation. Local property taxes. Most significant levies are tapped out, and the largest growth areas in the city of Peoria are capped out by TIFs. This map kind of tells the story, oh, well, there it is. <laughs> the map tells the story pretty uh, concisely. Uh, 
the idea of never-ending taxes is concerning. Right now, there is not a sunset on the half percent sales tax. But we have reached out to local legislators, and we have initial support that would enable a change so that we could add a sunset for our county to the sales tax. And we will continue pursuing that. But for our schools to be successful, we need equity in future conversations with the city of Peoria when it comes to TIFs. Our schools need to benefit from those TIF districts. Schools and investments equal better controlled learning environments, more efficient school operations, increased attractiveness to prospective teachers and students, more jobs for contractors and skilled trades workers from the area, additional business from service providers traveling from outside the area. These are pictures of the people who would benefit from this sales tax. We've got students, workers, and as Dan, Mr. Adler has pointed out, when all these projects come online, perhaps people will start buying more equipment from Caterpillar, and that's good for everyone here. <laughs> so the road forward. Uh, the road to high quality learning begins with high quality learning environments, and it's one that we must invest in. We are respectfully asking our voters to say yes to our schools and support this critical funding measure Thank you for helping us create stronger schools, stronger students, and a stronger economy. We look forward to a continued partnership to help provide the best education we can to our students. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? I have a, just a brief comment. Um, did, did I? Oh, yes, of course. You. Uh, started out your comments and you said that how you're putting together this initiative and did I hear you say that you have yard signs? Are you going to put together yard signs? We will signs? have, yes. Could you please make sure that Mrs. Jackson gets at least two or three? <laughs> of <laughs> <Just> course. <laughs> please. Do you have room? Thank you very much. That was a great big yard. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Adler, did you have anything to add? I would just uh, comment that uh, you know, our, uh, our campaign is uh, an upstart operation, but uh, Ms. Tortora has definitely uh, brought um, a lot of uh, energy and, uh, and uh, coordination to uh, our effort, and, and we are pretty optimistic um, that we'll make a good case to the uh, voters uh, this fall. So uh, certainly uh, anyone in the audience or at the board table, um, with the exception of our full-time paid employees, um, we would appreciate your support in uh, advocating for this uh, for this uh, measure. I'd, I'd like to add, uh, Dan, is that uh, we want to make sure we cover all the neighborhoods. So it's important to include all of our agencies in the south side, the north side. Uh, they are voters. Uh, and we ought to hook on to all those people to make sure that they understand uh, what we need to do as it relates to our schools. Don't forget them. <laughs> At least the people here will, <laughs> will realize how much they need air conditioning well, in this area. And I'll right? be glad to help. So. <laughs> Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, proposed expenditures over $2,500. Uh, Do you have any questions of Mr. Willis? Anyone have any questions of Mr. Willis? Okay, comments. Uh, report of request under the Freedom of Information Act and the status of such requests. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Since our last board meeting, on August 22nd, we received five requests. Of those five, two were filled. Um, there was one pending request noted on, on August 22nd. That one was also filled. And so to date, we have received 43 re requests for this calendar year for a total cost of $1,449.50. Thank you. On the freedom of information. Oh, I got it. 
I, on this it says information request requested, but it disappears, so I'm not sure what what it says. What the one that said um, public spending information, including both. You know what yeah, that is. So Mackenzie, it has your name by it, and it says it's pending. Is that number 247, Ms. Jackson? Yeah, number 247, Smith. Public spending information, including. I mean, that's, that's a yearly FOIA that we get for all expenditures, for all vendors who pay over $10,000 for. Okay. It's a commercial for you. Okay. We get a lot and, of and the one that says information on acceleration policy. Whose name is on that? That's that uh, is Gershnich. So they probably Susan. The acceleration the acceleration pro policy. They just probably need any information in terms of um, what we do to okay. our policy regarding acceleration. We have Susan and um, no, they they have to supply the information. Okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. They're the supplier of the information. Right. Okay. Cut and send agenda. Mr. Ash. Vice President Ash. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the consent agenda consists of the following items for this evening. Uh, item number one, gifts to the school district. Uh, this meeting, uh, gifts totaling $130,000, 140, $130,147.38. Year to date, $131,572.38. Item number two, the payment of bills. Item number three, payment for travel. Item number four, board travel request. Item number five, the human resources report. Uh, item number six, uh, the uh, agreement with the Holt Center. Item number seven, uh, an agreement with uh, life transformational counseling. And item number eight, the 2016-17 application for recognition of schools. And that's the entirety of the consent agenda. Thank you. Are there any uh, uh, numbers on the consent agenda? Someone, anyone wish to pull for a separate uh, vote or yes, conversation? Please. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, items number six and seven, please. Okay. Others, anyone else want to pull anything from the consent agenda? Uh, if not, I'd like a motion and a second to approve the uh, consent agenda, so uh, with the exception of seven, number seven and eight. So six, and seven. Six, six, and seven. six and seven. Six and seven. Six and seven, that is correct. Second. Okay. Would you call the roll, please? Mrs. Kostick? Aye. Dr. Davison Avilas? Aye. Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Shaw? Aye. Mr. Walther? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Seven ayes, motion carried. Okay, uh, number six, let's take number six first. May I have a uh, motion and a second? I move that we accept item number six. Second. Okay, and now discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I only ask that this be pulled because uh, upon reading uh, the, the uh, agreement that the Holt Center for Healthy Living provided, I was um, quite favorably impressed with the incredible detail to Illinois learning standards that are associated with their curriculum. They did a terrific job aligning their curriculum with uh, Illinois learning standards, which is uh, uh, a hallmark of transparency and accountability, just the kind of stuff I love to see. Uh, and so that's why I asked that be pulled. Okay, other comments on that item? Number six. May you call the roll, please? Mrs. Kostick? Aye. Dr. Davidson Avilas? Aye, plus. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Shaw? Aye. Mr. Walter? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Seven ayes, motion carried. Okay, um, number seven. 
I have I a motion. I move that we accept item number seven. Second. Moved and second. Uh, discussion. Second. Yes, uh, and for the very same reason, um, I ask that the agreement with uh, Life Transformational Counseling be pulled because as I read um, the prospectus, um, a little, uh, in the indicating uh, the kinds of outcomes expected by their interventions, and this little statement just jumped out and poked me right in the eye. It said, academic success. And so to the extent that, once again, we will hold this, uh, uh, as we would the Holt Center, um, hold this group uh, uh, accountable, uh, uh, and they have uh, uh, been clear that they're contributing to our educational mission. Uh, again, that just warms my school board heart. Uh, <laughs> and that's why I, um, a, a quick question, though, on this. Um, I have a prior relationship with Queen of Howard. Um, Love, hate relationship. No, <laughs> professional. I know. It's professional, nice. and uh, yes. so I'm, I'm not quite sure on whether I should abstain or. You probably should abstain. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, but not because I don't like it. All right. Okay. Great. Um, yes, ma'am. Um, just a brief question on how how this and uh, social emotional tied together, how what she does and what um, Derek Luke does. How do they tie, and how closely will they be working together? There, they'll be working. They'll be working very closely together. She she provides. Um, she'll provide case management, mental health, substance abuse counseling, and um, also the kids have to conduct the drops and you know those sorts of things. So she gets in that realm, um, and that, so she does that. So for all the kids that are on a band relating to alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. They have to go through They have her. to go through her and she has to follow through and follow up with them. She does the home visits. She makes sure that the, the drops are done and they, they're clean and provide documentation and case management. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any no other uh, comments? Could I have a, a vote, please? I mean, a roll call. <laughs> Mrs. Castor. Dr. Davison Avilas. Abstain. Mrs. Jackson. Aye. Mr. Shaw. Aye. Mr. Walter. Aye. Mr. Adler. Aye. Mrs. Ross. Aye. Six ayes, one abstain. Motion carried. Deliberation agenda. Revocation of expulsions held in abeyance, Mrs. Cox. The, proposed, <laughs> the proposed action is that the revocation of expulsion held in abeyance listed on the report September the 12th, 2016, be approved as amended. Second. Revocation of board probation, the proposed action. Let's, let's do the, the first I'm one. Sorry. Uh -huh. Mrs. Kostick? Aye, I'm sorry. Dr. Davidson Avilas? Aye. Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Shaw? Aye. Mr. Walter? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Seven eyes motion carried. Number 10. The proposed action is that the revocation of board probation listed on the report dated September the 12th, 2016, be approved as amended. Second. Mrs. Kostick? Aye. Dr. Davidson Avilas? Aye. Mrs. Jackson? Aye. Mr. Shaw? Aye. Mr. Walter? Aye. Mr. Adler? Aye. Mrs. Ross? Aye. Seven ayes, motion carried. Any presentations by, uh, or suggestions by board members? I have one. Uh, Mr. Walter? I have a couple of questions, and one of which, or two of which, may have to ask legal counsel for some direction. Um, the discussion that we had tonight about the closing of the Woodruff Academy, um, my interpretation that, that was a board policy or a policy that was developed, would that be an accurate interpretation? I don't, I'm not familiar with the no. closing and, and how it was done, so I would have to get more facts and opine on what was, okay. what was done, so I apologize. Well, but. yeah, that was my question. Uh, obviously, Dr. Bob and uh, Mr. Sean and I are new to the board, but uh, 
not having gone through this before, I just wanted to see what purview this fell under, because under 2.240 board policy, um, there is a provision in here that says superintendent implementation. And it said the board will support any reasonable interpretation of board of education policy made by the superintendent. If reasonable minds differ, the board will review the applicable policy and consider the need for further clarification. In the absence of board policy, the superintendent is authorized to take appropriate action. Uh, I feel that's what was done here. Uh, but I would like to bring up at the next meeting, I will submit that to Mr. Adler and Mrs. Ross, um, that we actually vote on the closing of Woodruff. Um, we had discussion tonight, and I appreciated the input. I really appreciated the input from my fellow board members. I thought it was a good discussion. And um, I think that's all I had on that. The second question I had, which may get to legal counsel again, um, we had at the last board meeting, uh, I had made a motion, and it was, I think, agreed to unanimously that we table um, the distance learning project. I didn't see that on the consent agenda. And it's my understanding that that can't be implemented without a positive vote from this board. You may not be familiar with that, what yeah, we did. This, again, look at your policies and how that was done. If it's been tabled, it is an act that should be revisited at some point in the future. Okay, that's what I thought. That was my understanding. That's all uh, I have. Ms. Jackson. You know, I don't want to get us in the habit of second guessing the superintendent on everything there's a there's might be some controversy I you know we hired Dr. Karat to run the school district she is the person to do that the board sets policy but she runs this district and when she makes a decision it could be controversy and I know the board can come in and, and say we don't agree with it or uh, do something else. But I don't want to get into this thing of every time we believe that the superintendent made the wrong decision, then we go to the group that believes she made the wrong decision and then try to turn over what she's done. She's at that district every day. She knows exactly what's going on. She knows what needs to be done to take care of this district and put it on the right track. And we're still trying to put this thing on the right track. I don't want us as a board to start second guessing everything she does. I won't do that. And I'm gonna tell you, I'll bring it up every time when it happens. Now, granted, they may not agree with what happened. I haven't decided what to do with it. They may not agree with what happened, but she made the decision. I don't know why we have to now come back to try to deal with something that she's made, the decision that she's made. And I'm not going, I'm, I am not going to look at every detail or every decision she makes to turn it around. We'll never get anywhere we, could, we do that. And I don't intend to stand still. I want to move forward with this district. I want Dr. Karat to succeed in this district. I want our children to succeed. I want our teachers to, to succeed. You know as well as I know that when people have a, make a decision, I don't like that, then everybody will come and say, Mr. Walter, I don't like this. Fight for me. Or Mrs. Jackson, I don't like this decision, so fight for me. So we will be spinning our wheels, turning over and doing flips, trying to satisfy everybody. And I ain't going to do that. I just am not going to do that. And I hope this board don't put themselves in a position where you are making decisions about this district and not selling, setting policy and implementing those policies. That's what I have to say, and I'm saying it now. So I'm not going to do that, and this board hopefully won't, con won't get involved in decisions coming out of that, because we, we hold her accountable. If she don't do it right, guess what? what is, she's our employee. So let's not hamper her in trying to do what's best for this district. With, with all due respect. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Walter? Yes. Okay. 
with all due respect, um, basically you had indicated, Mr. Jackson, you haven't made up your mind. If we don't do anything, you have made up your mind, you're agreeing with the superintendent's decision. I do take this job seriously, and Mrs. Ross always reminds me it's about the kids, and I think it is about the kids. This decision dramatically impacts kids, and as, as Dr. Karat says, 1,500 other kids. I think, as an elected official, I don't think there's anything wrong with us being on record as to where we're at with that. Because if we don't do anything, we've already accepted the decision that Dr. Karat has done. And I do think she does a good job. In this case, I don't think she did a good job. There was no input from us. There was no input from the staff. Derek Booth found out about this. The principal of the school found out about it on Tuesday afternoon. That is not transparency. That is not collaboration. That was an administrative decision made in a vacuum, as far as I'm considered. So I'm not, I don't want every decision to be considered like this. I just don't think this particular decision was handled well. And that was the reason I had proposed that oh. and still proposed that. Okay. Then so. instead of going out, instead of going out and talking to everybody, I, I think you should have come back to the board before you even went to talk to them. Who can I come, come back to the board with? The decision was already made. No. It's done. The well, kids are out of the school as of Friday. There was no decision well, made. It's done. Well, okay. Um, point of order. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dr. Bob. <laughs> she says that better than I did. <laughs> I would uh, like to, as I mentioned, and, and I did this in private earlier, and when I mean private, I don't mean a private meeting. We just happened to cross paths in the hall. Uh, and I mentioned uh, to Dr. Dave Milan Karat my thanks uh, for her ruining my beauty sleep last night, which is why I'm so ugly today, I suppose. <laughs> um, we did have a long conversation. I'd like to reiterate a couple of things. Um, I tend to see things differently, Mrs. Jackson. Uh, I don't see this as an example of every time, every day, every detail, every decision. I see this as a... As, it was, a, frankly, the first time I've had a conversation about something that I disagreed with. And I think open, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's healthy. I think open comments to one another. Um, uh, I certainly didn't make any decisions uh, about anything. I wasn't involved in this. Um, and um, so in, in terms of making decisions, I don't see whether that was how that was impeded. Uh, just how it was handled was different. Um, as far as uh, people coming to me later on um, and saying, fight for me, well, candidly, that's not what was happening. What people said to me was, listen to me. That's what I was responding to. It's just people wanting to be listened to, not fought for. Last May, um, and then June, July, and August, we released a number of teachers, and I have been told we have to do that. That's, we, we've always done it. We can't do anything differently. And one of the things that I like to say when somebody tells me you can't is si se puede, which means yes, oh yes, I can. It arguably, arguably, now this isn't the only factor, but arguably, the fact that nearly 80 teachers, many of whom came back, but when I did the counting, the last time, the last numbers I had was close to 80 last year, were released. Several of them voted with their feet and didn't come back. And the fix, and, and what happens is when that happens, down the road, Woodruffs happen and proximity learning happens. Um, th those two things are, again, arguably directly a cause of the fact, uh, caused by the fact that um, we don't have the faculty to, uh, 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 and teachers that we need. Had we made that decision, and frankly, I would suspect that because that decision has become so entrenched in our culture that the genesis, the origins of this happened several years ago. That's what I was talking about with systems thinking. It's, we're, we're, we're reactive and in a panic about Woodruff and uh, uh, about getting enough substitutes. When in point of fact, if we had changed the way we had done things as usual in the past, we wouldn't be sitting here. Now, that's not an indictment. Hear me on this. I support Dr. Dame Moulin Karat. That's just, look at it. How's that working out for you? Not so good. Well, let's change it. I, I, I don't see that there's anything wrong with that. And frankly, I think that's healthy uh, uh, self-governance. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? Um, 
You know, I, I misspoke earlier when I said. Did you want to speak? Go ahead. Thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you. Um, it's kind of on my own matter, a concern of mine, if you guys don't mind, um, other than the Woodruff um, crisis, or however we will put it. Um, something that Mr. Walter and Dr. Davidson Avila has mentioned is how they attended the schools and actually, students actually got to interact and like communicate with them. And I find that extremely healthy and positive. Um, something that I encourage the other board members to do um, is to get involved more. Um, this is coming from a student who has been heavily involved since he can remember. Um, grandfather is at every school board meeting and my family is heavily involved. I didn't know of like who was my board leader, who was my representative until I got on the board of education. And that's not a jab at President Ross or any other board members. It's just a simple fact of as a board member, we're representing students in these communities. So I just believe as a representative, you would be able to communicate like what is going on in that community in that whether it's in the educational facilities or outside of the community. Um, like I said, this was the first time I've seen board members in an educational facility. And I've been at Manual since seventh grade. Um, I can't speak for other schools. I have heard the same thing. I've heard, I've heard different. But that's just from my observation. So this isn't an insult to the board members. It's just um, encouragement and a challenge if we would say, for our board members to be involved in our educational facilities and outside of our educational facilities in the community as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, unfortunately, you, you probably missed me. I'm hard to miss, though. But I did. I actually did the academic, uh, you know, report card program with you all. And uh, I do all of the, usually do all of the graduations. And, and I'm in and out when you were doing the student program that, that you did. So I mean, I'm always in and out. Everybody knows me on the south side of Peoria. I mean, yeah, and it's not a jab at you at all. No, no, I it's know. Just, I mean, I, I see you at um, graduations, but honestly, and like I said, it's coming from me in my personal opinion. That's just the only time I've seen you. Yeah, you probably um, just missed me. So, Ms. Ms. That, Ms. but that's my I, um, perspective. Ms. Costick and I uh, visited schools, and um, you know, we intend to visit more as we go along during the year, usually only two board members can visit. But we, we do, you know, that's how we know what's going on in schools, basically. And I'm, I'm not going to beat a dead horse to death. <laughs> that's an old saying that I use all the time. Uh, but in the, you know, what I've seen and what I've seen over the past 15 years, actually there were people on this board longer than me. Phyllis Markley was here for 20 years and different other ones, you know, so don't think I've been here too long. But the fact is, <laughs> you ever heard of the, the cliche soup warmed over and, and doing the same thing and expecting different results? I mean, we've been, we've been doing that. I've been through several superintendents. And I'm not saying that board members shouldn't question the superintendent. And perhaps we, pro we probably should sit down and have some dialogue around what's going on and, and what the plans are and that kind of thing. But what I'm saying is every time we hire a superintendent uh, to do a job, we, in essence, I'm saying we don't let them do the job that we hired them for. But uh, it, it's, it, just keep, it just keeps putting us farther and farther behind. If we were in an industry like Caterpillar or some other industry, if they, if they say, here's what we're going to do, you're not going to see people come out. And, and now, believe me, I understand why they're, why they're here. And many of those students I know. I mean, from Roosevelt, one of the kids there was in the band, and she knows me very well. Ms. Jones and her daughters and that, they live right around the corner from me. But my point is, we have to think about all the, ch the children. And I say we've left a whole segment of children behind. I mean, a whole segment of children we've left behind. And, uh, and 
Illinois Central College will say they graduate and they come into our schools and, they're, and they have to get in remedial classes in order to even go start going to college because we're just graduating some of them without what they need. So I think we have to give direction but also support and trust the person that we put in charge of this district to uh, make sure that our kids um, get what they need. And if she doesn't, once we give her the authority and we support, if she doesn't, then, you know, we have to do what we have to do. Mr. Shaw, did you have something? Right, and, and I've been silent on this issue so far tonight. Um, the decision, it, it made a lot of sense. Um, you know, when I, when, I, when I learned about the decision, and tonight I found out about the impact. So I, that's the information I didn't have um, when I heard about the decision. That being said, um, we have empowered the superintendent to, to make that type of decision. However, if she were to walk it back, I don't think that many people would be upset with that. So. I don't think we were at a point that that can happen uh -huh. at this point. <laughs> we do need a big fan. It's back there. Chris has got it. Um, where are we? Reports from board committees. Report from board committees. Are there any report from board committees? You know, I, I think I need to make this report. Dr. Bob and I met regarding the uh, um, parent advisory. And last year, I was just really, was really bothered that we sat at meetings and just talked. And, and absolutely did nothing. And I, I can't go to meetings and do nothing. At, you know, that's just a waste of our time. So I, Dr. Bob and I got together with, um, with Ms. Dixon and put together some concrete things that as an advisory committee we want to work on. And we identified, and step any time, Dr. Bob, so if I forget anything. And, and, and then we wanted to identify people to go to be on that advisory committee because the people that were on it been on it for ever and they're we're talking about the same things we know what the problem is I want solutions it's no good 10 years talking about the problem so what we decided was that we're going we need to set some goals but the key was to get the members and and um, I, I'm working with um, uh, Chris Copeland. We want a, a representative from high school, a representative from middle school, and a representative teacher from elementary. We want a business person. We want a parent. Right. Tell me. We want, <laughs> yes, we, did, we had a, um, so we, we wanted a teacher, one from each level, so that would give us three. Um, one elite member, one business member, and I think I've got it. Uh, five parents, right? Because right. you know, it, it's, obviously, it's parent names in the committee, uh, and from the community, somebody. Uh, we we kind of thought about this back and forth, and it seems a natural if we could get somebody from United Way, um, yes. somebody who works. You know, one of Don Johnson's mm -hmm. lieutenants, maybe. Uh, not 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 a single agency, but somebody in right was that what that we works were, with all the agencies. Were, yeah, right. Yeah. He's um, no and, there, and so, yeah. um, oh, Don Johnson's not Yeah, but uh, we can still you can tap get into somebody. that. And that gives us that gives us eleven members. Yeah. Uh, and then, if I may, or go ahead. Uh, so then, the next step is we have a naturally occurring group in every single school. We hope. And so, uh, and if we don't, this would be one of the first steps, which would be um, to contact every PTO. And if there's a school that does not have a successful PTO then one of the things that this committee ought to be doing is helping them create successful PTOs. So that would be one of the, now I haven't read the charge of the committee and if, if we have a formal charge. Yeah, it, it's to, to bring parents, teachers and children together to, to work in a cohesive way. Right. And, and that it, it's designed to try to get parents into the schools. Right. And so, so that's where we're, uh, rather than reinvent the wheel, the idea that we would have members who are in the community, just about everybody that we listed um, already has a vested interest in Peoria Public Schools. Um, uh, um, 
the naturally occurring group, the PTOs, you know, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. We'll take advantage of what's there. And then let's see how it goes. Yeah. I think and, that's a good start. I think it's a darn we, good start. We talk about moving toward a long-range goal, and that's to have a PTO in every school. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a long-range goal, and we know that. But there's some short-term things we can do in between. Yeah, we're, so. we're working on that right now. We yeah. have one for every school last year, and we're close. There might be about five schools that... Yeah. And Dr. So, Dave Milan Karat, if, if, and you and I can touch base, um, particularly if you can help me uh, on, on uh, picking uh, or, or how, to, how to pick one teacher from each level, we could probably uh, uh, have a chat with the union as well um, to uh, get some input on yeah. that. Hopefully we can meet in October as a, as a committee. Okay. Well, just to give you a little bit of history, I was a start of that committee. It, it was state statute that we develop a parent-teacher advisory committee so that um, parents and teachers and other uh, people would get involved in uh, it. Had, it was centered around discipline, not just in the schools, but on the buses as well. And what came out of that initially, those first couple of years, was the, um, the policy, the discipline policy. And we developed the, um, the infractions and then the consequences to those infractions. So the next step would be to try to get more parents involved in, and uh, I have some information for you all I can, I can give you, and Dr. Karada and I are going Kristen, to be meeting. Kristen, won't you think we weren't doing anything? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, Dr. Karada, is this just FYI? Just FYI. Okay. Um, if there's nothing else? Could I have a motion to adjourn? Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, uh, Dr. So, Bob, I should let you. Oh, second. I can take it if Dr. Bob, I wanted to tell you, I misspoke a little earlier. I forgot that. Uh, uh, Doctor is working on a process. You. I was oh, you're yeah. okay. <laughs>